I'm sorry, Hassan, I'm not giving over. All right, buenos dias, good morning. I'm going to try this again since the executive committee wasn't as excited as I was, so I'm going to say it again. Uh, I'm super excited because this is the last meeting of the year. Is everybody else super excited like I am? Yeah. All right. And it's also the last meeting before the holidays, so it's my favorite time of the year. Uh, it's December 8th, Board of Directors meeting is called to order. So first, I'm going to ask our interpreters to explain how to access interpretation. So please go ahead. An interpreter. Buenos dias. Good morning. To use the interpretation feature, please scroll to the bottom of the Zoom screen where the meeting controls are. Click on the interpretation icon world and select English as your language. If you're joining through the Zoom mobile app, cell phone, tablet, etc., please press the ellipsis, then interpretation, and then choose your language. Finally, click on mute original audio to not hear the original Spanish low in the background. Headsets are available for interpretation if you're in the meeting room. Please check out a headset from the receptionist in the lobby. Aviso por parte de la intérprete, para hacer uso del servicio de interpretación, favor de desplazarse a la parte inferior de la pantalla de Zoom, donde aparecen los controles. Haga clic en el icono de interpretación, globo terráqueo y seleccione Spanish, Español. Si está utilizando la aplicación móvil de Zoom, celular, tableta, etc., presione los puntos suspensivos, luego interpretación y luego el idioma. Si no desea escuchar el audio original en inglés en el fondo, por favor seleccione Mute Original Audio, Silenciar Audio Original. Contamos con auriculares disponibles para el servicio de interpretación. Si se encuentra en la sala de reunión, por favor pedir auriculares con la recepcionista en el vestíbulo. Gracias. Thank you very much. Um, let's go ahead and uh, start uh, with our tribal acknowledgement. I'd like to take a moment uh, to acknowledge the land that we call home. The tribal nations of the San Diego region have historically faced injustices. We acknowledge that harmony that existed between the land, nature, and its original peoples who have since endured displacement, persecution, and systemic oppression. We pay our respect to the unceded territory and homelands of the 18 tribal nations in our region, the most in any county in the United States, from our cultural groups, the Kumeyaay, the Guiño, Luceño, the Cupeño, and the Cuyay. The land has nourished, healed, protected, and embraced them for many generations in a relationship of balance and harmony. As members of the San Diego community, we acknowledge this legacy. We aspire to learn from indigenous traditional knowledge and experiences in undoing the injustices of the past. Can you uh, join me, please, for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic all right miss tessa can you please call the roll good morning for the city of carlsbad council member burkholder burkholder present for city of chula vista is absent city of coronado council member duncan present County of San Diego, Chairwoman Vargas. Vargas present. Um, City of Del Mar, Councilmember Gasterland. Present. City of El Cajon, Mayor Wells. Here. City of Encinitas, Mayor Kranz. Is absent. Um, City of Escondido, yeah. Mayor White. Is absent. City of Imperial Beach, Council Member Fisher. Here. City of La Mesa, Council Member Shu. Here. City of Lemon Grove, Council Member Mendoza. Here. City of National City, Council Member Molina. Present. City of Oceanside, Deputy Mayor Kime. Here. City of Poway, Council Member Frank. Here. City of San Diego, Council Member Campillo. Here. City of San Diego, Vice Chair Ilo Rivera. Present. City of San Marcos, Council Member Musgrove. Present. City of Santee, Mayor Minto. Here. City of Solana Beach, Second Vice Chair Hebner. City of Vista, Council Member Melendez. Vista is absent. Executive Director for Caltrans, um, Gustavo Dayada. 
Here. MTS, Mayor Pro Tem Leva Gonzalez. North County Transit District is absent. Imperial County is absent. USDOD, Anna Shepard. Port of San Diego is absent. San Diego County Water Authority is absent. San Diego County Regional Airport Authority, Director Cabrera. Here. Mexico and San Diego County Tribal Chairmen's Association are absent. That concludes the roll call and confirms the quorum. Thank you. Now, before we proceed to uh, non-agenda comments, I'd like to remind everyone in the room today that this meeting will be conducted in an orderly manner to ensure that the public has an opportunity to be heard and that the members of discussions and deliberations are not disrupted. We want to hear from every person who has comments on the subjects of today's meeting, but I'm going to ask that comments remain on topic. No comment shall be used loud, threatening, profane, or abusive language that disrupts the orderly conduct of the meeting uh, as it will not be tolerated. Any such language or any other disorderly conduct that disrupts, disturbs, or otherwise impedes the orderly conduct of the board meeting is prohibited. Per our board policy, the amount of time allotted for each verbal public comment is determined based on the number of agenda items, the complexity of those items, and the number of persons that participated to offer comment. Um, this allows us to offer to hear from as many people as possible and to complete our business while we still have quorum. Based on these factors, for today's meeting, each member of the public will be allowed a minute for their comments. I'm going to go ahead and ask our clerk to uh, begin with non-agenda public comments. Thank you. I have five in-person public commenters that will be taken at the beginning of the meeting. Corey Schumacher, Sarah Ochoa, Alan C., Michael Brando, and Catherine Rhodes. The following public commenters will be taken at the end of the meeting. Paul the Bold, Consuelo, Truth, Alex Wong, Blair B, the original draw. Corey Schumacher, please come to the podium. Good morning, SANDAG members. My name is Corey Schumacher. I am the political director of IBEW 569, uh, but today I am uh, here in my capacity as a citizen to uh, communicate my uh, gratitude for the work that gets done here. SANDAG is an intentional community made up of the public, staff, and board members. We work together to work on very large projects that span sometimes decades and the intentional community that joins here um, fosters a, an environment within which we work on those projects. Um, I'm grateful to SANDAG staff today who have the expertise and institutional knowledge to move these large public works projects forward and those staff members who are doing the people's work on this board. Uh, we appreciate you and thank you for your work. Our next commenter, Sarah Ochoa, please come to the podium. You will be followed by Ellen C. Good morning, Chairwoman Vargas and board members. My name is Sarah Ochoa and I'm a, I live at Chula Vista. As I look around this room and observe the seats you fill on behalf of the communities you represent, I find myself curious about your personal journeys. At what point did you decide you wanted to be in service to your neighbors? Sure, there are mornings you wake up knowing you will need to dig deep into your resolve to meet tough challenges. I'm sure some nights following hours of grueling meetings and official events that the exhaustion is overwhelming, but I'm sure there are moments of profound joy along the way when the fruits of your combined labor come together to build something new that directly meets community needs. Councilmember Shu, thank you for bringing your experience and passion and love for justice to this work. Councilwoman Molina, thank you for uplift uplifting the people of National City every time you speak and vote. San Diego communities deserve the care you all bring to this work. Your journeys brought you here, and I honor you for choosing this path, and I thank you. Don't let anyone steal your joy ever, and thank you, Hassana Krata, for your service. Ellen C., please come to the podium. You will be followed by Michael Brando. Morning, board. Uh, Council Kirk, please listen to this. This is very important. If all consent items today was pulled by the public, this will allow seven seconds per agenda item. This, this limits the public speaker, which item we decide to pull. It's, it's, that's horrible. California Brown Act, Section 54954.3b. The act specifically authorizes the legislative body to adopt regulation, regulations to assist in processing comments from the public. The body may establish procedures for the public. Comment as well as specify, I emphasize this, reasonable speaker time. 
Seven seconds per uh, item, that, that is not reasonable. We are breaking the law, Council Kirk. We need to look into that. That's against the Brown Act, that's against First Amendment. So please look into that because we the public should be allowed to address this board with a legitimate amount of time. Seven seconds does not cut it. I yield back. Michael Brando, please come to the podium. You will be followed by the final commenter at this time, Catherine Rhodes. Michael, I just heard this outrageous comment by Corey Schumacher, intentional community. That is another nonsense phrase, intentional community. Why? Because if something's built on a false assumption, false presuppositions, false foundations, then it's going to fail. Jack Shu at the executive committee meeting said, we want Sandbag to do well. Well, it can't do well if it's involved in lies. I hear a lot of you talking about health and healthy communities. I made a speech at the County Board of Supervisors on Wednesday. I was the first one in non-agenda. I'm gonna bring this up again today, but you can watch the longer form if you wanna go back and look for the Wednesday, December 6th meeting. There's a book by my friend, Mark Gober, called an up an end to upside down medicine an end to upside down medicine and it's about consciousness and i assure you people that when 2024 comes comes so much is going to change and you're going to need to be on the right side of history do what is honest and truthful our final comment on non-agenda items at this time Catherine rhodes please come to the podium Hello, this is Catherine Rhodes, and I want to announce today that I'm going to file to run for mayor of San Diego. And the reason for that, thank you, and the, and, and the reason for that is because I can solve the homeless problem. I have solutions. I have so many solutions. I've been studying this for decades. And the thing is that in San Diego, we're rich. We're as rich as can be. Yeah. And the county of San Diego has done so much great work in the last couple of years as it relates to homelessness and actually doing um, and actually changing um, their zoning ordinance at my, of course, my request. And so what will I do for you here in San Diego? The first thing I would do is make sure that um, Hassan, when he said he was going to get that 350 million or so from the airport authority, so far you've gotten zero money. I'm going to get that 350 million for you. Not only that, I'm going to get you billions of dollars from the airport. You're allowed to have billions of dollars so that we can um, fully fund the airport with no sand egg money. Thank you so much. And that concludes the non-agenda public comments at this time. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to Hassan. Thank you, uh, Chair Vargas. Good morning, uh, board members. Actually, wait, let me go ahead and do member comments first and then I'll turn it over to you. I, I messed up. Any member comments at this time? All right, seeing none, I'm going to turn it over to Sasan. Then I'll say good morning, board members, again. We'll do it after that. Uh, thank you. Um, let him speak and as speak and many of you know, this is uh, my last board meeting uh, as your CEO. Uh, and I want to thank you uh, deeply for the amazing five years uh, that uh, I worked with you, for you, and I work with an amazing 450 employees here. Uh, I was thinking a lot about um, the two minutes I have this morning and what I would say. Uh, and I remember back sitting there in the middle of this room uh, five years ago, interviewed by this board. Well, some, some of you weren't here, but some were. Um, remembering uh, Mayor Minto and the subcommittee and other asking these subtle questions. Uh, and remembering back that I came here at the time Mayor Kevin Faulkner uh, gave me a mandate. Um, and that mandate was to reimagine the future, develop a vision, deliver for San Diego, and most importantly, bring money from Washington and Sacramento. Uh, and I think, Everything we did, it's because you have an amazing team working for you. No matter who is your CEO or next, he or she, they will be successful simply because you have an amazing staff that I hope you uh, let them know how amazing they are. Committed public servant, try to do the right thing. 
So uh, in, in five years, um, yesterday I was in Los Angeles in the morning speaking on the importance of infrastructure to the economy. And um, this region uh, is used as an example how infrastructure fuels the economy. Ray Major and myself were at that conference uh, talking about the amazing things uh, that this region does. From there, I drove to the border to meet Secretary Amashakan and Assemblymember Alvarez to uh, meet with our Mexican partners. And finally, to uh, say that Otay Mesa 2 will be real next year. We are now in the final phase of designing the facility. All the infrastructure has been done. The agreement with Mexico and the toll revenues has been signed. Uh, we are awaiting, uh, we're starting the 30% design and awaiting to deliver a one and a half billion dollar project and convey it to the federal government. I'm proud of that. Um, of course, that was done because of the amazing team we have, but I'm proud to be part of it because this is a project that has a national, statewide, and regional significance. This is a project that's gonna reduce hundreds of tons of carbon monoxide for vehicles that normally idle. This is a project that Mr. Shu will be happy about, that it will enhance the health of our community. I'm also proud that we're going to shortly have a, a work, a final or an, a second or a third, I, I don't remember how many already, workshop on the loss and alignment, moving the track of the bluff. I'm grateful to uh, council member, um, 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 Castroman. 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 Okay, I'm, 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 I'm forgetting my name. I'm, 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 <laughs> I remember her and I had that discussion before I even pursue with my team moving the track of the plot. And we agreed that that has to be done, that temporary fixes are not. We went out and we got significant amount of funding. Now we are in the environmental phase, talking about the real project. I'm also grateful. Uh, for all of you for helping us move the airport um, rail connection forward. You heard about that last month. We're going to start the environmental. Um, the 2025 regional plan and the amendment to the 2021 regional plan. I'm also grateful that we manage with your leadership to put the opportunity, youth opportunity pass to quadruple the ridership of 18 and under to creating a culture. I'm proud of all of these things. And these things were done because of an amazing team you have here. I have no doubt, none whatsoever, that this will continue with your leadership and with the amazing team you have here. I have no doubt that as you choose your interim CEO with the team you have here, things will continue moving forward. Uh, as you know, uh, I couldn't um, conclude any talking points without a quote. I love quotes. I love historical quotes. So here is a quote by Michael uh, Angel. So the greatest danger for most of us is not is not that our aim is too high and we miss it, but that it's too low and we need, we need we meet it. We always damned high. We all we didn't always see things the same way, but we all have the same goal, and that is to aim high for the benefit of this region. I can tell you that uh, this agency stands for what's right, stands for the truth. Of course, there is different opinions out there in the sensational news media. But I would say again, that no doubt in my mind that you will continue to move this region forward. I wish you well in choosing your next CEO. I wish the, the interim CEO well. I wish the team well. I am not, um, 
uh, retiring. I'm going to still be working. I'm actually going to start January 3rd teaching at the University of Southern California at the graduate school, um, be the senior fellow at UCLA, uh, and I'll be working. Uh, I might take a few months break from the public sector, but our paths will cross. I will always um, be grateful for the last five years. They've been, I have to tell you, I poured my heart and soul with my team in this job. Um, it, it wasn't easy, but I'm proud that we will end up building a world-class organization when this is all done. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for for believing in, in the team here, and I hope you'll continue to believe in it. Chairwoman, for the last time, that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Hassan. And uh, I actually, I, I mean, first and foremost, I want to say thank you. I've had the opportunity to work with you for the last three years, two years of those. Um, well, I worked with you before uh, in my capacity when uh, as a governing board uh, president at Southwestern College and trying to make sure that our students had access and mobility, uh, particularly at Southwestern College when it was super tough uh, to get them from point A to point B, where I was truly inspired to try to figure out um, how to make sure uh, they were able to have access uh, to transportation that was accessible and where uh, we were able to, you know, later on, we were able to work with so many of them and the advocates to make sure that they had the youth opportunity passes that you helped us uh, make a reality. So I'm really grateful to you. But then being able to serve in my capacity uh, as a county board of supervisor and uh, serve as chair of transportation for two years and now in my, uh, as, as the chair of the board. I want to say thank you uh, for all the work that you've done for the region. Um, you know, I, I do believe that it takes uh, bold and courageous leadership uh, to challenge all of us uh, in, in the county of San Diego to really think about ourselves um, in a different way. We are 18 cities and unincorporated areas that at times um, we can work in silos and it is difficult to bring people together who are very much um, individually uh, advocating for our communities as we should because we've been elected to do so, mm -hmm. uh, but to be able to come together in a body like this and to try to really think globally and to think about what we can be and to be able to imagine how we can uh, go above and beyond so that um, our mobility opportunities can be uh, such that can make us a community of the future can be competitive is not something that a lot of people can do. And with that, not only just to dream and to believe, but then also to bring over a billion dollars in five years, more than any other CEO has ever done, um, I think, is where the rubber meets the road. And so um, a lot of things can be said, but actions uh, and deliverables is I think where is extremely important. So I appreciate your leadership. I appreciate um, that, you know, we can agree to disagree on a lot of different things, but uh, you, you delivered uh, for this uh, community. And so I'm very, very grateful to you and uh, the successful launch of the Mid Coast Corridor to uh, finally moving forward with the transit connection to the airport and uh, you know the funding for the project for the Del Mar Bluffs and, and the Lausan Corridor, uh, the amazing go type post, the amazing support, port of entry. And again, I think uh, there would not be an equity action plan at Sandag if it wasn't for your leadership. Uh, I know that many in the community, I think I'm assuming that I'm gonna put you on the spot that I, I know that you're gonna be I'm sure talking about this because many of us who were activists and organizers and who were sitting on that side for many years before we were sitting on this side uh, talking about it, uh, never even dreamed that those things were going to be a possibility, including the Youth Opportunity Pass. So I'm grateful for you and we got, uh, I think it's important to acknowledge it and to say that we are, we are thankful for your time and uh, we are looking forward to continue to work together. Don't forget about San Diego when you're advocating at the federal level and the state level, uh, because I know that uh, Santa continues to be a model internationally, 
nationally and statewide thanks to you. So grateful for you. Muchísimas gracias. And uh, we got you a little something over there. But um, and uh, where is the? Do you have the? This is what you're supposed to. Oh, yeah. So I got your proclamation because this is the coolest part of my job. In case anybody knows that. So um, so I won't read it all because you know. But I'll tell you. Um, Whereas Hassan, uh, Chief Executive Officer of SANEC, has been the CEO for five years. You have accomplished opening, uh, you have accomplished in, uh, launching the Youth Opportunity Pass program in 2022 and allowing all youth 18 and under free public transportation on all services in the region. And accomplishments include secure funding for the largest federal grant nationally for OTME support of entry and accomplishments including funding all sorts of different things. Um, and I won't read the whole thing because it's all on. But anyway, we have a long meeting, but uh, be it proclaimed by Chairwoman Nora Vargas and the Board of Supervisors on this day, 8th day of December 22, that we commend Hassan for his outstanding service, leadership, and commitment to the citizens of San Diego County and do hereby declare to the state to be Hassan throughout the day through San Diego County. Thank you. 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 Any comments? Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I'll, I'll kind of start big picture, and then there is some specific stuff I'd like to thank Hassan for. Hassan, I, um, I appreciate um, that you've pushed San Diego. I, I did not grow up here. Um, I moved here for law school after visiting here many, many times because I saw the incredible potential in San Diego. Um, I think this, and I, I've had the good fortune of living in other states and other, other countries, and I think that San Diego can be just an incredibly wonderful, wonderful city. And in my experience, the thing that often has stood in San Diego's way is San Diego, and it's, it's um, reluctance to want to be more. And I truly appreciate that you have forced that conversation and I recognize that that is uncomfortable at times and it can be rocky, but I, I think it needed to happen. Um, I, I truly, truly believe it needed to happen. It needed to, be, it needed to happen with respect to um, what the city can look like in terms of tangible changes, but also um, with respect to less tangible, but even more important things like equity. And you forced that conversation, you've stayed committed to forcing San Diego to think about being more and being better. And I truly believe that the region is going to be better off for a very, very long time as a result of that. And so thank you for that. Um, as the chair said, um, on a more specific note, um, and I think it's a great example of what we were just talking about, those youth opportunity passes, Hassan, as you know, that was a decade of advocacy. Um, a half decade before I got to get involved in the campaign, moms and grandmas um, who wanted nothing more than their young people to be able to access opportunity um, and knew that transportation, access to transportation was the way that their young folks could access opportunity, um, knocked on every door in town and had very little success. And it, the, the whole conversation shifted when you got here and your openness to it um, put us on a path to eventually be in a place where, I mean, this is something we should all be very proud of, really, that every per every young person in San Diego can now get on public transportation and get to the places that they want to go and need to go. Uh, and you pushed to help us do that. Um, and so, again, whether it's the, the, the tangible or the intangible, um, what I will be most grateful, what I am most grateful for is the way that you've pushed San Diego to stop being the provincial um, past focused place that it can often be and be a place that um, many, many more people see itself as, um, see as being able to be greater and be truly amongst the best cities in the world, not just in name and in a superficial way, but in the way that, um, that impacts the people who live here. And so thank you for, for forcing that conversation. Thank you for pushing. Um, I am grateful for it. And again, I think that um, the whole region is going to be better off for it. Thank you. 
Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Hassan. Um, much has been said that I agree with um, the big picture, that the vision that you have and that you brought to San Diego, especially, and the fact that you did kind of push the envelope for everybody in this region. The accomplishments that you um, you've made are are significant, and it will leave a mark on San Diego. That's a good mark. I mean, just the few things that we've mentioned. Definitely, the youth opportunity pass, um, uh, prioritizing the Los An realignment, the airport connection, Otay Mesa. Really, I mean, all of these things are huge projects that are going to make an impact for many, many years. But what hasn't been mentioned is your admiration and respect for your staff, and I just really want to emphasize that. And we appreciate it very much. We're going to miss you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, before, thank you so much. Before we move on into our business for today, um, I wanted to start off by saying that I, like many of you, um, and there's some um, baklava and some other things to fill that you know. Uh, anyway, okay. I wanted to start off by saying that, like many of you, I've been uh, closely following uh, recent articles on SR125. Um, so today we're going to be discussing the matter and exploring our next steps on this matter. Additionally, I want to make sure everybody knows that I've been meeting with our independent performance auditor, Courtney Ruby, and I've asked Courtney uh, to uh, join us. Uh, so she's going to be assessing our total operation system as part of our commitment to accountability and transparency. I'd also like to uh, provide an update on the 2025 regional plan. We're going to be kicking off the next phase of this process at the January 12th board meeting featuring a staff hosted workshop to gather insights for plan development. Um, and with Hassan leaving at the end of this month, uh, hiring our next CEO is one of our top priorities. And so as part of our agenda today, we're gonna to be discussing the appointment of our interim CEO. Before getting to that, I'm gonna ask uh, Pam Derby from CPSHR to share highlights from the stakeholder engagement and public outreach activities uh, that were completed last month and tell us a little bit about the next steps in the recruitment process. And so I'm gonna ask Pam to come up here and let us know where we are with that. Good morning, thank you, Chair. Uh, as the board had requested, we have been conducting community and stakeholder meetings uh, over the last three weeks or so. Um, the purpose of these meetings and this information, we use it in the marketing materials that we present to prospective candidates. Um, it helps inform our outreach process so that um, we've heard what you're looking for and that we ensure that we're looking for those qualities when we're speaking with prospective candidates. And it's also very important in informing us about um, all of the things that we can that we need to probe for when we're asking questions, when we're putting to questions together for the board, when we're doing screening interviews with the candidates. We use this information in many different ways. And so in that regard, then we've had uh, community engagement meetings. We've had an in-person meeting. We've had a virtual meeting. Uh, we have had, there's been an online survey that was open for about three weeks that closed on Friday. Uh, we had almost 400 respondents to that survey. Um, we have been doing calls with stakeholders. We've spoken with many board members up to this point. Those are ongoing with some of those stakeholders and members of the board. And in that feedback, there have been several high level, these are the high level things that we've heard about. And they would be community representation, more public engagement, diversity and inclusion, climate action, uh, compliance and environmental sustainability, commitment to safety, a public transit focus, policy guidance and political collaboration and compromise. Now, as I said, these are very high level uh, the areas that we've been seeing, all, obviously there are a lot of different comments in those areas. The next steps, there's gonna be a full report released next week that will be sent directly to all board members. It will be available on Sandeg CEO recruitment webpage. Um, and then after that, you know, we'll be using it as we move forward in the recruitment process. Uh, the recruitment is slated to open the first part of January, and then we will have an open period for about 60 days before we start talking to candidates. And with that, I would entertain any questions you may have. Any member questions? 
So, all right. So, I just want to make sure that I remind uh, everyone that uh, there is for first and foremost for um, our Sandag team, the staff members. We've created a CEO recruitment page on the Sandag website that is um, updated regularly, so that you are all. My commitment to you all is that you are um, able to check in there and, and get information, and all of you have been able to provide um, input as well. And then for members of the public, uh, if you have questions or input regarding their recruitment activities, you are able to reach out to all of us and we can uh, make sure that we, you know, you, you can provide feedback, et cetera. And so um, lastly, uh, I wanna make sure that I also, thank you, Pam. Um, we'll, we'll keep you all updated. Um, this is very important for all of us. Um, last but not least, um, I wanna say thank you to Gustavo. Gustavo, today is your last meeting as well. There's a lot of people, everybody's retiring, what's going on? Uh, well, you're not retiring, but you know. Um, thank you so much for your service and for all that you've done. Uh, we are so grateful for your leadership and for your partnership. And I'm gonna turn it over to you so that you can say a couple of, of words. Thank, thank you, Chairwoman Vargas. It's been a great 33 year career in public service. Um, I've met many wonderful people. Um, and also uh, it's been great serving and uh, on this board. And it's been an honor because you all bring uh, a perspective from your individual uh, cities or, or portions of the county or unincorporated areas or other um, agencies. You bring unique perspectives that uh, makes us working together uh, a better a better board, a better agency in, uh, in delivering the transportation system, the multimodal transportation system that people need. I wanna thank Hassan for um, a great partnership over the last few years. I've gone on many trips with, with Hassan, meeting at the highest levels of government uh, here in the United States. We brought a lot of those people to San Diego and that has been incredibly valuable in, in showcasing our region, the great things that we do working together and all of the funding that has come as a result of that. So thank you, Hassan. And, I, and I've, I'm particularly impressed, not just by all the money that he brought to the region, but also uh, for his care about people, uh, people uh, of the agency, people of Sandag, also people that work for us at Caltrans, and also the public. Um, I, I think that his approach um, regards equity is the right approach. And, and uh, I wanna thank him for, for a great partnership over the last few years. And like him, I have no concerns about the future of Caltrans or Sandag here in the region because it's in great hands with the staff that these two agencies have and with the leaders that these agencies have. So, so thank you very much. Right. So, as I mentioned earlier today, uh, today is our um, last meeting of the year, but I wanted to let you all know that I am, as board chair, it's important to me that people, um, that the community gets an update of the work that we've done this year. So, I will be sending out a report, not only to the community, but um, to the team and the staff that summarizes some of the highlights for 2023, but I wanna take a moment to recognize some of the accomplishments because I think that this board should be very proud of the work that we've done. This year we passed um, a $1.2 billion budget that invests in every corner of the region. We followed uh, 
we uh, were able to approve more than 640 million of our budget over the next five years to advance critical transit projects throughout the county. Uh, we were able to release an online mapping tool for the community to provide input on the regional plan and collected over 2,000 comments. We also hosted 2,100 participants at our community pop-up events and workshops to seek input on the plan. Our team secured significant funding for major projects, including 100 million for the Lausanne project and 140 million for the Ota Mesa East Port of Entry. And we made great progress in several important projects for our region, like the development of the Purple Line, South County Express Transit, the Airport Transit Connection, San Diego Mobility Hub, the North Coast Trans uh, Corridor, and the Regional Bike Network. We also shared a detailed review and celebrated um, our progress at our next, and we're gonna be celebrating our progress at our next meeting for January 12, along with a forward-looking perspective into the initiatives uh, shaping 2024. Uh, we've done a lot of really good work, and so I wanna make sure that we share that with, with our communities. Uh, transparency and accountability are key to the work that we're doing. And as I shared with all of you um, during our board retreat uh, at the beginning of this year, all of you asked for a lot more discussion um, and ensuring that we didn't use, I'm just gonna say it, that we didn't use the way to vote for our meetings. And I wanna make sure that I emphasize that we didn't use the way to vote for any of our budgets, that we didn't use the way to vote for any of our meetings. And I think we did a really good job at having really good bold and uh, discussions on everything. And I think that we've done a great job of uh, moving this uh, agency forward. So I'm really grateful for all of you. There's still a lot of work to be done, but um, I appreciate the work that we've done so far. So with that, we're gonna move forward with uh, 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 public comments for the next items on our agenda. Our meeting today is gonna start with three closed session items uh, that we must take before we go to the next item. So it's the public comments for these first and then um, after that, we're gonna clear the room. And so I'm gonna ask Tessa to uh, provide public comments for items two, three, and four for the closed session items. Thank you, Chairwoman. I have seven public commenters on this item, six in person and one virtual. Catherine Rhodes, please come to the podium. You will be followed by Truth. Uh, this is Catherine Rhodes, and uh, most of you know I'm a civil engineer, and I have my master's in civil and environmental engineering from San Diego State. And so for our next um, CEO, I actually think it should be our deputy chief executive officer, Colleen Clemenson. I think she's been um, a nice calming voice here at San Diego and has um, really brought a lot of people together. And so um, when you go into closed session, please consider her. Um, one of the main reasons is she has the, the knowledge. Um, it takes years to understand what's going on in Sandy. When you first came to Sandy, most people had no clue. It takes years to learn all these things. And she has the institutional knowledge to um, move the projects that you guys approved forward. And so um, I recommend that you you hire her um, and not hire, not go outside of Sandy. Um, or not go out of Sandeg and hire somebody else in Sandeg. But I actually think that you should ha hire within and not somebody from the outside. Thank Who, you, your time thank expired. You. Our next commenter, Truth, you'll be followed by Consuelo. <clears throat> Item two, of course, I had to go to the only in-person public outreach about the new CEO. I was the first one there out of a whopping six people. And that includes the wonderful Corey and the late arrival Shane Harris, who campaigned for only one election district of the affected region with a monologue worth 15 minutes of our time. But it was good to talk to Pam and Ramona. And to me, that small atmosphere was a lot better than the regional planned workshops and their post-its that didn't seem to stick. But it was the same thing with this presentation, sorry to tell you. Almost nothing I said or heard was included. And of those survey results, how many were filled out by the same person? What were the protections against manipulation? How was any of the supposed outreach done during the holiday season on a Monday night in Encanto with no signs on front letting people know about it, different than a toll system that doesn't collect tolls? Item three, Lauren Warren versus Sandag for wrongful termination and retaliation after only five months of work. It's obvious why there's a shutdown of communication here. Just another Sandag flub and snub. 
And item four, why does Santa require storage at Santa Fe Street? Is it hidden records or something? I don't know. Item two, I'm gonna agree about uh, Colleen. She's Thank next. you, your time expired. Consuelo, please come to the podium. You'll be followed by Paul the Bold. And I'd like to take a moment to state for the record that council member for City of Chula Vista, Council Member Chavez, County of San Diego Supervisor Anderson, and City of Vista Council Member Melendez are all currently present. Oh, and Mayor Kranz <laughs> is also present for the City of Encinitas. Go ahead, Consuelo. Okay. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to uh, remind the county, whomever the next CEO is, to please get involved. They are um, actually, you know, they're penalizing the people that do come. So we need more support. And um, it's really evident, like I said on the phone earlier, that, I mean, gosh, uh, I'm... I, I'm surprised how, you know, we have two security guards now, um, 60 seconds to speak, limited the rows to two. They truly, I mean, it speaks volumes about how they really do care about the uh, people's input. They don't. So again, I encourage the county to come in, even to, especially to the Board of Supervisors meetings, just to see how, um, what they are doing and to pay attention. Thank you. Our next speaker, Paul the Bold, please come to the podium. You will be followed by Mark. Hi, Paul the Bold. Um, happy holidays to everyone in the room. Uh, holding three consecutive closed sessions at the beginning of the meeting reeks of disrespect for people who give their time to participate in the public process. Now, last night, it, um, the Union Tribune hinted pretty strongly that, um, that uh, the mayor of San Diego was a leading, um, leading candidate for the CEO. I think that would be a mistake. We don't want someone who bypassed a committee that he set up himself, and he seems to be kicking can down the road on a number of issues, such as the homeless um, and affordable housing. Uh, I believe um, someone who actually your time has expired. research would be great. Our next great commenter, person. Mark, please come to the podium. You will be followed by Mike, who will be followed by our yeah. first our virtual commenter, the original draw. Mark, hearing Nora and Elo's lies about making San Diego better as they kiss up to his son is absurd. We are very close to Chinese communism uh, with smart lights, ALPR cameras, 5G, and many authoritarian policies. Uh, Sandag is the center of treason regionally, and their new CEO will be a tyrant. Um, you guys have been presented with many much better, superior plans to the things that you guys push, including this guy's rigid, um his project to bridge the bluffs up in Del Mar for a quarter of the money you're going to spend. That second he was done, no one ever said a word about it again. It, and it's much the same way the Coronado Bridge is suspended all the way across the ocean. So um, also I told you how for a 50th of the price, you could have low income housing built across the border, a 50th. 10,000 each, uh, 20 by 40 foot homes, not half a million dollars. And it could also secure the border, uh, be bulletproof on the back, totally doable. You guys are Your being time led has by evil. Our age. next commenter, Mike, please come to the podium. You'll be followed by our first virtual commenter, the original draw. You will be followed by the final commenter, Blair B. Good morning. Um, yeah, I think a lot to touch on with regards to uh, our next CEO, um, my opinion, the fix is in. It's just going to be another slob like what we already have. Um, the damage that you've done to this community 
and this county is irreparable. And yeah, I'm talking to you, Hassan. It's absolutely horrible what you've done to 3.6 million people in this county. You've divided us, you've made things more expensive, and you've made things more stressful. And that's on you. Not to mention your silence with Nathan Fletcher, with Chula Vista, with the city of Vista, the corruption that sits at this table is astronomical. And you do absolutely nothing but sit in silence in support. Congratulations. Our next commenter, the original draw, followed by the final commenter, Blair B. Original draw, please go ahead. A good thing that you guys will reap what you sow. And, you know, the fact that I mean, you guys are the ones that are, you know, going to be deciding who is going to be the CEO when you are filled with corruption um, just shows that nothing is ever going to change when you have Hassan, you know, firing people because they were exposing, um, you know, mischarges um, on the um, toll road. Uh, you know, it's just sad that when people come and expose things just like the people, you want to strong arm them and, and shut them up. So it has nothing to do about being transparent or open and accountable. But you guys have a mission and you're doing it very well. And the fact that, I mean, if Todd Gloria, oh my gosh, that would be completely disturbing. But basically anybody that you pick is going to be telling as far as, you know, what you need to continue to push. But you will continue to usurp your authority and act like you dictate things over the people when the people have authority over you. And so you're going to need somebody to continue on your destruction path. Your time expired. Our final commenter, Blair B., please go ahead. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman. Uh, I've lived here for about a year and a half now. Uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of serious uh, corruption issues throughout the county. I think we're better understanding and uh it's with better understanding we can learn not to do these things again i hope our county can be learning better practices and i think we will be uh good luck in those efforts uh i think the uh whoever it will be the next uh ceo the the previous one has done a remarkable job around uh working with tijuana i think i just been amazed at his work uh, that I think is an example for the country of how San Diego is is a gateway to uh, to, to to different uh, countries of the world. And, and uh, so just a real good luck how we can continue those practices around border issues, uh, communication, dialogue. Uh, good luck in our efforts. Uh, I, I'm just amazingly impressed how you've done that, uh, those practices. Thank you. That concludes the public comments. Thank you. All right, with that, we're now going to move into closed session. I'm going to ask everyone who does for closed session items to please exit the room. We will reconvene uh, to share any reportable actions and take the rest of our items for today after closed session.
All right, um, we are back in open session. I'm gonna turn it over to Mark and John for uh, reportable actions. Oh, actually, before I turn it over to you, I wanna just... Uh, we just wish uh, the council member a happy birthday. Council member Kylan, happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. I'm not gonna sing for you because I have a horrible voice. Pero feliz cumpleaños. <laughs> Thank you for having your birthday with us today. All right, uh, Mark and John. Sure. Uh, the board met in closed session on item two, and there was no reportable action at this time. The board also met in closed session on item three with respect to that item. The board voted to deny the claim and to defend the referenced litigation. And on item five, there is no reportable action. Number four. I'm sorry, on item four, there's no reportable action. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you. Okay, so the next item on the agenda, we're gonna welcome back for uh, consent ag agenda item now. So I'm gonna turn it over to public comment, uh, Madam Clerk. Thank you. Um, this is public comment on every item on the consent agenda from items five through 13. Our first commenter, Alan C., you will be followed by Catherine Rhodes. Please come to the podium. I guess we're only allowed a minute still, so. Item six, Transnet. We've been promised it's 87, expand the freeways. When's it gonna happen? I'm gonna jump up to item 12. Let me tell you a story of what happened when we, since that is now known and void. My councilwoman was, was elected because she was the alternate, now she's a primary. Chavez, congratulations. But uh, it was a very ugly scene. There's a whole stack of union members sitting in the audience. They didn't speak on stop the water rate increase. They didn't speak on the homeless workshop, but they all damn sure stood up and spoke to make sure John McCann wouldn't be the primary because they knew he was going to stop the mileage tax, which, yes, there is a mileage tax down in San Diego, South Bay right now. It's called the 125, which I'll talk about later. In addition, look at your inbox. I sent you emails. Our uh, current director is getting ready to leave, sent an email to State Carb, along with Vargas pushing it, that they're going to sneak in the mileage tax without the vote of people, which is now called the road use tax. Consider all that. I yield back. Our next commenter, Catherine Rhodes, you will be followed by Paul DeBold. Oh, um, could we hold one moment for that? Hello, this is Catherine. Give me one second. Give me one second. I meant to say this before again. Um, so I meant, I meant to announce this on the consent item. I'm going to go ahead and pull item number 12 because the city of Chula Vista made a decision during their board meeting on Tuesday, uh, November, December 5th, um, and their new appointee to the Sandak Board of Directors is Council Member Carolina Chavez. Uh, her alternate is uh, Council Member Alonso. Gonzalez and their second alternate is the deputy mayor, Jose Preciado. Am I correct? Yeah, something like that, right? So I Thank think you. That's um, official title please. or something. Go so ahead. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, take that off and then we can continue with the rest of the items on the consent agenda, which are items number uh, five to 13 minus 12. All right, go ahead. Thank you, go ahead, ma'am. Oh, wonderful, thank you. I'm here to speak on item 10, the 2024 World Design Capital and item 13, the advisory membership request for the Association of Planning Groups for the Unincorporated People. Um, I, I agree with both of these. And you know, one of the big ideas that I have for the World Design Capital is my La Playa plan for a full tide reclamation to create a utility, excuse me, a transportation corridor um, from, um, from the airport all the way down to the border into Tijuana that would help with that cross-border thing. And so instead of doing the blue line, we could actually, and this is cheap, this is something that's very inexpensive to do. Trenching is cheap, tunneling is expensive. And so what I wanna do is trench and create a big, huge, giant trench 
um, all the way down to Mexico, use that sand um, for construction material because we um, take sand from um, Canada now, we import our sand. And so um, that, and then I think the advisory person for the unincorporated area, they really want a voice. Thank you. Paula Bold, you will be followed by Truth. Please come to the podium, Paula Bold. Um. Okay, um, welcome board to Carolyn, Mrs. Chavez. Um, corrupt officials should be replaced, including at Sandag. Um, on the Del Mar thing, does the title Project 5 mean that you have had to stabilize the bluffs uh, four times already? If so, we can't wait for the tunnel to be started in 2028, four years from now. Please make sure you fill in all the blanks on any contracts that are written, by the way. Um, and uh, on item seven, uh, you want to delay the transportation development plan audits. To me, this suggests that some people might be using improper facilities, like in, insufficient total collection devices. It's happened on Route 20. Thank you. 20, Your time expired. Our next commenter, Truth, please come to the podium. You will be followed by Consuelo. All right, item five, the minutes fell to capture Nora's corruption versus illegal fiasco. Or note what time Nora left the October 27th meeting on her open Fridays. Item six is $12 million for government to monopolize land using the excuse of conservation to protect fairy shrimp while killing feral pigs. Item seven, Sandag's public participation plan that seeks to involve all citizens is an utter failure. Item eight, Katie and Hassan went to the Sandag-sponsored Lake Arrowhead Symposium to hear about reparations and congestion and parking taxes. And Nora emitted more GHGs going to South Korea. But should we be doing business with a developed country that has the highest rates of suicide? Item nine, over $17 million for a three-mile bike lane. Crossing trolley tracks and highways is dangerous, and nobody's going to use it. Item 10, what a coincidence that Nora just gave the United Nations-aligned World Design Capital a county proclamation. It's nothing but a public propaganda face to promote an unrepresentative binational association of governments. And item 13, the county's already failed at representing the unincorporated areas. So how is anything going to be different? Hence the VMT. I don't think so. Thank you. Your time expired. Consuelo, please come to the podium. You'll be followed by Michael Brando. Consuelo, uh, let's see. Yeah, I just wanted to make an announcement to get involved. A lot of the times they say the number to uh, contact the Sandeg uh, meetings really fast. So I just wanted to put this out. If you are listening online, it's the number is area code 669-00-6833. The web ID is 863 eight five two six three four seven uh we got to get involved san diego because um you know it's up to us to create the county we want to see to co-create and uh humans actually believe that it's government that gives them their rights it's not so get involved and uh let's see 10 sec 11 seconds left okay um yeah that's pretty much all i have to say our next commenter, Michael Brando, please come to the podium. You'll be followed by Mark. Michael, number 10, the World Design Capital. It's interesting that all of these, these different organizations, City of San Diego, County Board of Supervisors, Sandag, have all of this coming up all at once, the World Design Capital. I sat next to a doctor and spent the whole day with her on... Uh, it was Tuesday, the Tuesday County Board of Supervisors meeting, and they were giving the proclamation for the World Design Capital. It was the first she had, over, uh, had ever heard of it. She was completely shocked and horrified, just as Truth was talking about the binational region. I'm going to reiterate again, if you want to develop trust around what's going on here, you need to do 
advertisements, get people educated. They don't even know anything about this stuff. And that's what's cultivating a spirit of being sinister and distrustful toward you. Mark, please come to the podium. You'll be followed by the first virtual commenter, the original draw. Mark, one minute for eight items is total tyranny and uh, against the Brown Act. Uh, six, uh, environmental mitigation program is uh, just the beginning, a small step in the direction that the UN wants, which is uh, if we look up the wildlands map or the the UN Agenda 21 wildlands map, uh, they, they want us in little city areas and most of the United States won't be inhabited. You won't be allowed there. And that's really from the UN. So um, then 15, toll road operations assessment. We didn't spend money with our taxes to have roads that we can't use. That's asinine, really evil. Um, and uh, 13, board of directors advisory membership. Of course, you'll pick someone who does what you want and will not help the unincorporated areas or any of these smaller uh, unweighted votes at all. And now I'm about to run out of time. This is total tyranny. It should be stopped. It's Your obvious. Time expired. Our next commenter, the original draw, you will be followed by the final commenter, Blair B. Original draw, please go ahead. Yeah, everything you guys are doing is a bunch of fraud, waste, and abuse, and the fact that you have all these items under consent is just uh, proving that. But, um, you know, Transnet, all that stuff, and you think that you can, you know, mitigate the environment and stuff like that, you guys are so funny because you're destroying it. Um, and then, you know, your whole world capital design, of course, you got to do that. You don't care about the invasion of our border because you worried about the $50 billion that is being, you know, given made over the year um and you know you just really have to go along with the un and their whole um you know uh plan to enslave all the people which we're paying to do and the fact that you know the unincorporated area which is one of the biggest areas of the county has not ever had representation on this board is quite sad but neither do the tribal nations you just wound up saying you know what you can have an advisory position that's what we're gonna do for you it's so disturbing to see you guys act like you're making things better when all you're doing is destroying San Diego. <laughs> Our final commenter, Blair B., please go ahead. Hi, Blair Beekman. Uh, thanks a lot for uh, item 10, the World Design uh, Capital, uh, along with the approval of your meeting minutes today that uh, talks about the OTA Mesa project. Again, a thank you to the former CEO, who I think has had a lot to do with these things, uh, and creating uh, what I was trying to say earlier, a really important uh, ideas of how San Diego, it introduces the global south to this country, and just gives awesome ideas to this country, what international relationships can be about. So thank you for your work. I hope the new CEO can continue those efforts, uh, what, what uh, we've been doing here at Sandang. Thank you. And to conclude, uh, I wanted to mention about the mitigation, number, item six, mitigation of environmental report issues. Good luck on uh, dealing with issues of sand. Uh, we can't just dump sand and say that's the answer to everything. You have to be really sensitive about that issue in all the uh, in environmental efforts you, you'll be doing. Thank you. That concludes the public comments. Thank you. Are there any uh, member comments? Yes, ma'am. I will try to be brief. I, I will try. Um, so item nine, bluff stabilization. Um, this board, many members today who are here were not here then. Um, Del Mar and the residents of Del Mar, city of Del Mar and the residents have made it clear that they want absolutely minimal bluff stabilization. We argued against it at the Coastal Commission. The Coastal Commission did provide for mitigation and required it. This board did not fund that mitigation. Um, so this will be an ongoing problem. Um, resident analysis was done and there was a report sent to the board about a year and a half ago. So I'm going to ask that we could resend that to this board. Um, it's 
a uh, public record. Um, but basically seawalls, nearly two miles of seawalls are going to bury acres of beach, you know, one and a half, behind the walls. So all along the toe of the bluff, it will lead to an increased amount of erosion of sand along the walls. We know that, and thus the mitigation. This is being done to Del Mar. Uh, we have no choice, and that's the source of the mitigation. It's not for Del Mar to pay for the mitigation. It's for SANDEC. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments? I'll move the uh, proposal agenda. Okay. Make one one brief comment. Yes, sir. <clears throat> I um, agree and I'm obviously totally comfortable with the uh, agenda item about the resolution regarding Chalubis's representation coming off the um, our calendar or our action items, but I just wanted to thank the chair for putting that on the agenda in case that was not resolved. So I appreciate that. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right, so we have a motion and a second. See no other discussion. We, um, can we please vote? And so uh, for purposes of the consent balance. I don't know if you're gonna be able to update it since item number 12 is no longer on there, but I think it's clear for everyone, right? Um, where's my chair? That item passes with 17 yeses, one absence and one abstain. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Uh, the next item on the agenda is item number uh, 14, uh, the appointment of the interim CEO. I wanna first start by thanking everyone on the recruitment subcommittee. Uh, our recruitment, uh, recruiter, Pam, Pam Derby, I'm gonna ask her to come up. Uh, thank you uh, for helping us through this process. This is a very important position. In closed session on November 17, we identified a preferred candidate for interim CEO. Uh, as the agency des designated a representative, uh, both uh, the first vice chair and myself, uh, to negotiate with the preferred candidate, I'm going to ask uh, Pam to summarize the terms and conditions uh, for consideration in just a few minutes. So I'm going to turn it over to Pam. Thank you, Chair. The term of the contract, this is a summation of the employment agreement with the new interim CEO. Uh, it would be a 12 month beginning on January 16th of 2024, ending December 30th of 2024, or upon the hiring of the new CEO, whichever is sooner. A uh, salary is 14,616 per pay period, which is equivalent to $380,000 per year. Uh, this is has been asked to be added as special compensation to and be perceivable. Salary increases, should this agreement be extended beyond June 30th, 2024, which would be six months, the employee would be eligible for any COLA adjustments that are available to all staff and be considered for merit-based pay adjustments as part of an annual performance review. Um, it is it is very typical for a new CEO to get a merit a merit review at six months, which would be the six month point there. Uh, 457 deferred compensation plan. Uh, the contribution would be $1,173 and change um, per pay period, which is equivalent to the 2024 IRS annual maximum contribution of $30,500 cell phone allowance of $160 a month, and then medical, dental, and vision insurance. The premiums would be paid by Sandag for the coverage of the employee and eligible dependents. Uh, the 457 cell phone allowance and insurance plans are all being offered to the current CEO at this time. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and open it up for public comment, and then we'll go ahead and open it up for member comment. Thank you. Our um, first public commenter, Ellen C. will be followed by uh, Catherine Rhodes. Our next PowerPoint slide up there. There was, a, I met one of your friends, Hassan, over at the uh, city planning down in South Bay. He mentioned that you destroyed his business was when you ran the LA department. Down in San Diego, you heard the news that you're stepping down and he cheered. I'm sorry to say it, but uh, yeah, that's what's happening. North Park, all the bike lanes took away business. Demolish tax, would you correspond with state CARB to implement road use tax without the vote of people? 
multiple lobster dinners, the uh, credit card. Alan, just make sure that you're talking. Uh, I am the talking item about the you. item concerning the pay, and you're interrupting. Three hundred million dollars, Del Mar truck. Where's the Del Mar truck? I can. I've spoken that a week prior, a week later, the government released three hundred million. Where'd that money go? So I pointed out all these items that you should not have got a population. You should have got a court summons. Because what has happened to this city, this county? No, we don't thank you, sir. We ask that the future, the next guy is going to rep represent the people and not special interests. I told you what happened down in Chula Vista with all the unions come down. Will you represent this whole board, represent the people or the unions? Should represent the majority. I yield back. Your time expired. Our next commenter, Catherine Rhodes, will be followed by Corey Schumacher. Hello, this is Catherine Rhodes. And of course, in the agenda, it said for this agenda item, it said um, the item was not ready at the time of posting and it would be posted with com one completed. I actually thought you guys already chose a interim Sandag chief executive officer. Did you? Did you not? When is it? When are you going to be choosing it? Um, so I don't know what you're doing. So again, I think that um, because Sandag, it's such a complicated um, thing to understand what's going on in San Diego. And I really don't think that you should have somebody outside of San Diego coming in here that doesn't know all the different site specific issues. And so um, I'm again trying to tell you that I, um, who I really think is your deputy chief executive officer, Colleen Clemenson. I think she's very professional. I think she's very inclusive and she would make a great um, replacement. And of course, I, I love Hassan and I'm very sad for him to go. Um, and I think she would be a wonderful replacement for you. Thank you so much. Our next commenter, Corey Schumacher, please come to the podium. You will be followed by Truth. Truth will be followed by Paul the Bolt. Thank you very much. Um, Corey Schumacher on behalf of IBEW 569, uh, representing 3,600 union electricians and power professionals throughout San Diego and Imperial counties. Um, just wanted to stand today and thank Hassan for your leadership and uh, for all the hard work that you've done to move San Diego forward. We really appreciate uh, the, the collaboration and work with you. Um, also wanted to ensure that um, as we move from interim to uh, full CEO, uh, just to reassert that we need a robust zero emission infrastructure system, more public transit like the Purple Line, and the uh, protection of uh, our work under SANDAG's project labor agreement, as well as other laborers, um, people who work uh, under SANDAG um, and work to build the infrastructure are residents of uh, San Diego County. And that is something that we're very proud of. That money gets cycled back into uh, the local economy. Um, we look forward to continuing to work with whomever you choose as the interim, as well as the uh, full CEO moving forward. Thank you so much. Truth, please come to the podium, followed by Paul DeBold and then B. Mitter Miller. Great. Aim high, achieve low. $580,000 a year. How much for the next CEO to push Sandag into the abyss? Or sorry, San Diego into the abyss. Sandag's already in the abyss. Who needs a cola with that chunk of change? That's my argument. Uh, I didn't appreciate the lack of transparency. It reminded me kind of uh, the event I went to where my feedback was not presented to you guys. But you know what? Before you go, Hassan, I've scared you like a kebab at many of these meetings, but I've actually appreciated your honesty about blocking the audit, about not building more freeways, and the politeness you've shown me, and I'm very genuine about that. I just don't like your five big bad moves or the San Diego backward plan, or employees getting more than $112,000 in bonuses and merit increases, or more than $227,000 in severance payments, or more than $110,000 in unused sick time to someone not entitled to the money, or a $60,000 severance to someone who voluntarily resigned all without board approval. And you can add the firing of whistleblowers to that list. Denied claim, right? We need someone who understands San Diego. We haven't had it. Our time expired. Paul DeBold, please come to the podium, followed by B. Mitter Miller, and then Mark. Uh, hi, Paul DeBold. Um, I, uh, from what I heard, you aren't planning to, but I certainly hope you aren't already giving the new CEO bonus pay like you did to the head of the County Health and Human Services Department before any work is actually done. Um, 
in addition, as I mentioned, uh, uh, there are some people um, that uh, just won't work out um, bypassing an advisory board, the privacy advisory board that the mayor created, and uh, people who uh, talk big about projects, but hardly get anything accomplished. I mean, San Diego is a mess. Um, I mean, if you want to go to a mayor, maybe uh, San Marcos or Your time expired. or something. Our next commenter would be Mitter Miller. Please come to the podium, followed by Mark and then Mike. Good afternoon, Chair Vargas and board members. My name is B. Mitter Miller. I'm a volunteer at San Diego 350. Um, Hassan, thank you so much for your vision and service. Really appreciate it. Although the selection of the interim CO has already been completed, I think, I'd like to express my hope that whoever it will be, she or he will continue to work for a regional plan that will follow the board resolutions to promote equity, health benefits, and lower greenhouse gas emissions. The science behind climate change cannot be ignored. As an agency, SANDAG should continue to reduce VMTs by improving all forms of transit, bike paths, and sidewalks, while also improving the safety of all travelers. Please keep moving forward. Thank you. Mark, please come to the podium, followed by Mike and then Michael Brando. Mark, I have no confidence in the governing board here um, to pick anyone that would serve the interest of the people whatsoever. Um, I have no confidence in Nora to execute an employment agreement, including such terms. Um, one, one term would be, that should be, is that the person that's uh, appointed should actually care about the Bill of Rights and, and uh, not be doing... Uh, promoting Agenda 21 things such as limiting people's driving, um, disarming people, um, the, <clears throat> I have 26 seconds left. It's, it's so absurd that we get this small amount of time. It's, it really, and there's a son with a shit-eating grin, smiling, now covering his face because he realizes that he's just, he, yeah, a clown. Uh, he doesn't care about us not having any time while you guys can speak indefinitely. There's a lot I could tell you. I'm sure you aren't all bad and you have good. Your time expired. Mike, please come to the podium, followed by Michael Brando, who will be followed by First Virtual, the original draw. Good afternoon now, Mike here. Um, yeah, the uh, frustrating part about all this is is that we really have no guarantees about the new CEO and how this weighted vote is likely gonna take precedent here. So I think essentially we're gonna have uh, Nora, Sean, quite possibly uh, Todd Gloria um, picking who the next CEO is, those three, that's it. Um, and I hope, and I hope the new person does listen a little better. Um, I know the chair would do her some good to listen a little better. In fact, Merry Christmas, Nora! I brought you a child's book. Maybe you can take a leak, take a look at it, take a peek at it. Maybe you'll understand where I was getting at Tuesday evening. But for the most part, I think it's awful that we're in this situation and we have such disdain for just about everybody at this table. There's very few Your time exceptions. expired. Michael Brando, please come to the podium, followed by the original draw and then our final speaker, Blair B. Michael, earlier Hassan said, Sandag stands for what's right and stands for the truth, and that is a lie. And so this new person coming in, I hope something can change, although I don't have any confidence in, the, in this because I see disaster 
coming to this board in 2024 and beyond. And for an example, just now we had multiple speakers up here and both Sean Elo Rivera and Nora Vargas were chit-chatting, just chit-chatting, completely disregarding the speakers, laughing, carrying on. It's no different than how those two behave at their respective councils and boards. So if the CEO, the new CEO can't handle or get this kind of stuff corrected, this board's going nowhere. I don't like to leave on something negative, so I want to say thank you to people like Jack Fisher from Imperial Beach, uh, John Minto from uh, Santee and Ed down there from San Marcos. They're not the only ones, but they were paying attention. Your time expired. Our next public commenter, the original draw, to be followed by the final commenter, Blair B. Original draw, please go ahead. So funny to hear people thanking demons for destroying things. It's so sad. Uh, and then you guys just soak it up. You're just like, oh my gosh, I'm so great at what I do. Um, and your item is very confusing because as, um, you know, has been mentioned, there's no information and you're supposed to be appointing the interim. So why would you say that if all you're doing is talking about their salary? You guys are totally not transparent. You like to mess with the people and, you know, giving out information. But the fact that it's like 380000 a year, it's so sad to think about all of the people who are suffering and that, you know, they're actually going to be paying out of their own pocket for the um, – you know, uh, salary of the people that are destroying everything around them that are causing them to suffer. It's like in every way we're being raped and in every way we're paying for it. I mean, the least you guys could do is use some hydrogel when you're doing it because it's getting a bit much to continually be, you know, bent over and raped by you guys. Your time expired. Our final commenter, Blair B, please go ahead. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Uh, yeah, I hope that uh, as a board on this item, you can be talking about uh, what we can be expecting in the next year. Uh, hopefully that's what your closed meeting item was about today. So you can uh, be talking about that uh, today uh, as the uh, agenda item to, um, right now. <laughs> um, uh, good luck in how our, our future uh, person can be, uh, a CEO can be talking about uh, I think what important ideas that we're working on is ride share, the future of ride share being uh, broadened a bit. And I know it's a sensitive topic. Good luck how we can sensitively develop that issue. And ideas of um, uh, within one bus line, having more buses within uh, a route. Uh, it creates rapidity, actually, and it creates uh, consistency. Uh, people can know they can get a bus in five to ten minutes. That's a good feeling. I don't, I'm don't. i beginner at these things. Good luck to work on this, and good luck towards tech accountability. Good luck in that conversation, too. Thanks. That concludes the public comments. All right. Um, so, any member comments? Does anybody want to make a motion? Yes, sir. Yeah, I want to speak just briefly to the idea that we're talking about the uh, salary before we do the appointment. And uh, the, correct me if I'm wrong, Counselor, but sh this is the way we have to do it because you know years ago we used to take care of all that salary stuff behind closed door, which nobody liked at all for obvious reasons. But we have to actually approve this um, before we can announce a CEO or temporary because if the board, you know, if we were appoint, made the appointment first and then we didn't approve the salary, then that person has the opportunity to say, well, I changed my mind. This isn't what I was uh, looking for. So by approving the salary and benefits first, then that person has the opportunity to say, okay, it's moving in the direction that I negotiated with uh, the executive board and therefore I will be your CEO. So it's, I understand it being backwards, but unfortunately we really can't do it any other way. So I appreciate all the comments about that. So I just thought I'd say uh, there, there's a reason the madness that you see here, there actually is a reason in this instance for it. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Minto. Councilmember Musgrove. Yes, thank you, Chair. And I just want to clarify the issue that whether an internal or an external, 
the compensation packet is the cap. So if it's an internal appointment, that will be the cap. And if it's an external, that will also be the cap. And while it is a lot of money, there's no denying that. This is a large organization where that person has, uh, will be entrusted with making big decisions and keeping all board members informed and effectively the County of San Diego as far as where we're going with our planning and transportation. So the compensation will be earned. Thank you. Thank you. Well, either are you making a motion? I'll move to approve. I'll second that. All right, so we have a motion and a second. Any additional discussion from my colleagues? Seeing none, please vote. That item passes unanimously with those members present. Thank you. All right. Um, all right, now that the board has approved the terms and conditions and authorized uh, the employment agreement, I'm pleased to announce that Colleen Clemenson has been appointed as Hannah's interim CEO. Uh, she will start the position on January 16th. Colleen is an accomplished and highly regarded public citizen. I think we should clap. Uh, Colleen is an accomplished and highly regarded public sector leader with more than 30 years of dedicated service to the San Diego community and region. She has been with SANEC for almost 20 years and is currently one of the deputy CEOs, a role that oversees the agency's planning, engineering, construction, government relations, and communi communications program, and is also an integral member of Hassan's leadership team. During her interview for the interim position, Colleen spoke about her goals for ensuring stability and maintaining the momentum of all the good work that is currently underway and preparing the agency for new leadership within when the CEO's appoint, uh, appointed next year. So uh, before I turn it over to her, I just wanna make sure um, that um, I highlight that it was a uh, uh, national search for the interim position as well and that it was a very thorough search. Uh, there was a uh, subcommittee of the board that did a very thorough search for that process. And after that uh, thorough pro process, uh, the board also uh, very, uh, I wanna say thank you for also uh, going through that process and uh, um, you know having the opportunity to interview um, a group of very distinguished executives. And so I'm excited to uh, work very closely with Colleen. And I know she's excited to work with the rest of the board as we move forward. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Colleen so she can say a couple of words. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chairwoman. And thank you to all of you for your confidence in me. And I want you all to know that I um, understand the gravity of, of the position that I'm accepting as your interim CEO. I'm very much looking forward to working with this amazing Sandag team and with all of you and the community to deliver on the work plan, the very aggressive work plan that you all have established for this region. I take very seriously the work that Sandag does. I think that is something you probably know about me that I understand how it impacts every single person in this region. And that's really what drives me to do the work that I do. Um, that work includes being good stewards of public dollars, of taxpayer dollars. And that's something I take very seriously and will work closely with our staff to make sure that we're using every penny wisely. As I shared in my interview, there's much to be done in this transition period. And I know it's possible with all of your support and the support of this board leadership. So I truly appreciate that. And to the Sandag staff, you're an amazing team. I know that you all know how much I appreciate you. I want you all to know how much I believe in you. We have a lot of work to get done and I can't wait to get started. So thank you all. Thank you very much. All right, the next item on the agenda is item number 15. I'm gonna ask uh, Andre and Lucina will present on the toll road assessment. I'm gonna uh, like to welcome uh, Ron uh, 
Fagan, our consultant specializing in total industry operations, who's joining us online today. And Jennifer Farr, our external auditor from Davis Farr, is also here to answer questions. So I'm going to um, turn it over to Hassan to introduce this item. Thank you, uh, Chair Vargas. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chair Vargas. Good afternoon, board members. Just a, a few uh, points before I turn it to the team. Uh, as you know, my job as your CEO is uh, to uh, uh, run the agency in all of its parts. And the toll operation is a big part uh, of this agency. Every day we make decisions with my team. Uh, decisions that uh, carry risks. And every day um, uh, uh, through discussion of these decisions, we determine um, how to take it, what the risks involve, et cetera. There's no difference here in the toll operation. We've been working on this for a while. We knew we have some issues. And we came to you last October and informed you of those issues. I know that uh, some question has been raised about uh, vendors slash consultant. But I want you to know that it's not the vendors and the consultants that reports to you, I do. The buck stops with me. If you want to blame anybody for anything that went wrong, you blame me. And so we're not in the business of passing blame down. And by the way, everything that goes wrong in this agency is my fault. And you should hold me to that. So, but I also want to assure you that at the end of the day, all of our customers will be made whole. Not a single customer will be charge a penny more or a penny less. We knew about uh, these issues a while back and we made conscious decisions of an approach. And uh, I will have uh, to tell you that uh, I wish it's uh, a decision about running the toll operation is not as switching the light on and off. It's a decision that involves highly technical um, a lot of things have to be thought about. So with that in mind, and I, I will tell you, we've gone through a uh, couple of top managers uh, changes at the toll. We brought in, I believe, one of the most qualified in the country from Oregon uh, to, to run this operation. And, and I also want you to know that I have received customers complaint about uh, customers waiting a long time in line, uh, not getting their question answered immediately. And that's not acceptable. As, as private citizens, we all expect to get a call back to have our question answered. We're working through those issues. And more specifically, uh, Lucinda and her team are working through the, those issues. But none of these issues uh, were secrets. We knew about them and we were dealing with them uh, all along. But I will assure you that when uh, you hear the presentation today, when you know the things that's being done since we spoke to you in October, I think this operation will be one of the best run operation um, that Sandag does. But the bottom line is the buck stops with me. Um, no, no need to point fingers to anybody but me if you feel there is uh, things that's not going right. And with that, I'm going to turn it to Lucinda and Andrea to do the presentation. Thank you, Hassan, and good afternoon, board members. So as Hassan mentioned, Lucinda oversees our toll operations and the customers that use the toll roads. And as your CFO, you typically see me present to you, the board and other committee members, various annual program budgets, our budget amendments, our annual financial reports, quarterly market updates, when we issue bonds and we refinance bonds for savings, anything generally that has to do with numbers. But the reason that I'm presenting this item to you today is to address allegations in the paper that we have customer account issues on our toll roads. There's no doubt that we have deficiencies in the accounting software of the current back office system that we are using. However, I wanna emphasize that the issue is not on the customer side that Lucinda is responsible for. It is in the internal accounting issue that occurs after customer transactions have been properly processed. Our goal today is to provide to you and the public 
with accurate information regarding the true scope of these deficiencies and our uh, efforts to resolve them. SANDAC currently services approximately 90,000 customer accounts. In August, SANDAC discovered that approximately 55,000 of those accounts did not accurately reconcile to the internal accounting general ledger by a total of $87,000. So the general ledger on the accounting side was off by $87,000 at that point. After identifying several common system errors that totaled $78,000, it was found that certain types of transactions were responsible for the improper posting of transactions from 45,000 of those accounts to the internal general ledger which has since been corrected. Again, it was not the flow of transactions. It was the flow of transactions to the accounting system that was not working. It did not impact the posting of customer transactions. The accounts not currently reconciling to the general ledger are now down to 10,000 accounts with a variance of $8,700. That $8,771 to be exact is a relative small amount compared to the over $50 million that we collected in tolls last year. However, we will not rest until we are 100% reconciled and balanced between customer accounts and the general ledger accounts. In fact, Fagan Consulting is currently working on the reconciliation along with our staff. Aside from the reconciliation issues I just mentioned, Sandag staff has identified other anomalies in customer accounts. For example, recently approximately 100 transactions were posted to the incorrect customer accounts and charged to the incorrect customer credit card, requiring staff to manually adjust and issue those refunds to those customers. Staff is continuously monitoring the system to identify any errors and customer accounts and immediately address them. You may also recall the reporting issues that we brought to you in the summer of 2021, where we noted that some of the old legacy system readers had failed and did not capture approximately $1.8 million in tolls. However, as Lucinda will mention in her report, all the old equipment has since been replaced and we closely monitor daily traffic numbers to ensure the equipment is properly functioning. Properly. It is clear that our efforts to move the agency to a new toll collection system have not been without its challenges. And those challenges are not unique to Sandag. So today- uh, Give me one second, Andre. Um, you can, you, can, you, can you go ahead and mute the consultant online? Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. So today, I will take you through a brief history of our toll, toll roads, I-15 and SR-125, and Lucinda will walk you through how a trip is billed to a customer, and Ron Fagan, our external consultant, will describe how the agency is engaging in testing and monitoring to ensure that trips and the tolls associated with those trips are accurately posted. I will also describe to you our efforts to disclose the accounting issue, <clears throat> to the external auditors, our bond council, and to you, the board, in closed session where we discuss potential need to initiate litigation. Finally, Lucinda will describe the agency's plans to potentially uh, move forward with a new back office system. I think there should be four main takeaways from our presentation today. First, we have identified the internal accounting issue that we continue to address with our consultants and our external auditors. Second, to give you confidence that our customers' accounts are accurate and identified issues are immediately addressed and corrected. Third, we have a long-term solution in place by moving over to a new back office system. And lastly, and the most important to me and to us here is that we have been transparent on this issue with our external auditors, our bond council, and to you, the board. So just to give a highlight of our toll operations, you know, currently we serve two facilities, the I-15 express lanes that are 20 miles 
specifically designed highways from San Diego north to uh, Escondido, and the SR-125, which is 10 miles from San Diego south to Otay Mesa. And as Hassan mentioned in the CEO uh, report, ultimately the Otay Mesa East border crossing, which is highlighted here in orange, will be uh, the next facility coming on board. So the I-15 uh, was built and operated in partnership with Caltrans. This is a transnet project that was started in the late 1990s and improvements have been made since for a total of just under $1 billion. Now, the transnet contribution was just over $100 million. And so that means that we were able to manage, nine, manage to leverage $900 million in federal and state dollars. The express lanes are free for carpools, van pools, transit riders, cleaner vehicles and motorcycles. Solo drivers get a fast track transponder to use on the express train for free and depending on your trip can be anywhere from $5 to a maximum of $8. <clears throat> and dynamic pricing is used to manage congestion in the express lanes. The median barriers also move to increase or decrease the number of lanes in each direction. Now, Sandak purchased the SR125 franchise out of bankruptcy in 2011 at a 65% discount for $341 million. Initially, the facility cost just under a billion dollars. This was a Sandak uh, board made a strategic acquisition to improve the mobility within the Southwest San Diego region by expanding the network capacity and reducing traffic congestion on parallel links such as the I-805. The discount purchase price allowed Sandak to lower toll rates by 25 to 40% to attract and grow traffic on the toll road. That strategy has worked. In 2011, we used to average 26,000 trips a day. Today, we are almost double at 51,000 trips per day. Now, I-15 currently has no debt. However, when we purchased the SR-125 out of bankruptcy, it came out came with some pretty onerous debt and the facility was rated triple B minus. Now, once we were able to improve the financial metrics in 2017, we went to the bond market and we issued debt and we refinanced the old debt, saving approximately $147 million in debt service. We have since been upgraded in 2017 and we currently have an A plus rating for all the reasons listed here. And today we currently have $167 million in bonds outstanding. And that is why it is important to keep these ratings up to have a great operational system. And so now I will turn it over to Lucinda who will describe our operations and how we capture traffic and appropriately bill users. Good afternoon again, Lucinda Broussard. I'm the Director of Regional Transportation Systems. I came to Sandag about a year, and, not even a year and a half ago. My last stop was Oregon, but I have been all over the country doing tolls. So east, south, um, I was in Georgia, Texas, Florida, uh, East Coast, DC, New York. So I've done the Easy Pass. I've done Golden Gate Bridge. Oregon, I was setting up their design, and then Washington, I worked for the Washington State Department of Transportation and started up their Good to Go program there. And Good to Go is their whole trademark name. Um, so I've been doing this a lot. This, not, it's, I hate to say it's not new and very comfortable, but everything is changing. It's a lot of technology, and it's a lot of customer service, and that's what we do. So first, I'm going to explain what we do on the roadside, then I'm going to explain the back office, and then I'm going to get into what the issue is that we're here talking about now, the 45,000. So, um, and as Andre was saying, when we purchased the road in 2011, uh, the purchase agreement, the franchise agreement, we were the operators, and we actually not only bought a road, but we, brought two, we bought two systems, the back office system and the roadside system. So we bought what was out there, it was already been operations for probably about seven years. Most systems last between seven and 10 years, so the system was getting kind of old. Um, in 2016, we went out for open competitive procurement, and we had four people or four firms that moved forward. ETAN was one of those firms, and they were selected. And it was brought to the board in December 2017. Um, their goal or the schedule had them delivering 
see, I don't have that here. Their goal, uh, their schedule had them delivering in 2018. So they would have delivered October 2018, and then they would have had system acceptance in 2019. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me go back one because this is CAPTCHA. So they would have delivered in 2018 also. And CAPTCHA does, CAPTCHA is our, our roadside vendor, and they do a couple of things on the roadside. So on the roadside, I, we have a gantry, a picture of uh, some hardware up there, which we call a gantry. But on there is a reader that reads your transponder if you have one. Also has the ability to take pictures of just your license plate. So we don't get pictures of people in the car. All we get is a picture of the license plate. So the vehicle that's using the road does not have a transponder. They get a picture of that. So the roadside puts together all that information, date, time, the place. They also put together what the tow rate would be for that trip. So all of that is done in the on the roadside piece. They work hand in hand with the back office. And the back office is, it's kind of like, it's your CRM, it's your financial system. It's also your transaction processor. Um, so it's doing, it does all of those things after it receives the trip from the roadside. The back office system was also old. And in 2016, we went out for a new vendor, open procurement again, ETAM was chosen. That was brought to the board for approval. Um, E10 started 2016, was supposed to deliver 2018, like October, um, and they were delayed many of that time, much, much of that time. So their deliverables didn't come in on time. Um, they had problems with resources. But in 20, the expectation was 2018, we would get a new system. So we would get that in, in it's kind of like that updated technology that we were after. And in 2018, we had started the interoperability. So if you use, or if you're a customer of Sandag Fast Track, you can use any Fast Track enabled system in California. And all of those transactions have to come through the system to get posted. So not only are they posting all the tra trips that are coming in in San Diego, they also have to post all the other trips too. So it's a little bit more sophisticated than just a bean counter. They actually are moving those transactions from one place to the next. Um, they had some problems in delivery um, and it was really delay, um, not having enough resources. It, there were kind of a few factors. So not having enough resources was one of those factors. And then actually not having the deliverables, what am I going to do on time for us was another. Sandag decided that they would stay with ETAN during this delay, um, and a few reasons. We still had systems going on I-15 and the 125, so it wasn't an immediate, it, we weren't shut down, we were still collecting tolls. Um, we were, had the expectation of new technology, and that we did not, I mean, at that point, we're still waiting on that new thing to happen. So we decided that it would be in our best interest to wait. Procurement take years, uh, about a year to do a procurement. I know in other places I've worked, it's been longer, but about a year. And then systems take about two years to get delivered. So we would have taken another, we would have waited another three years to get something. And that's hindsight, because today we're sitting here and, and they're four years, they were four years late, but we did not know that at the time. And um, if I may, yes, the sir. board director just emphasize this point. And that's what I said in the beginning. This is not something that was secret. We knew about, we sat in, in the executive conference room and we had a choice. Um, cut relations with vendors and potentially have a risk of not being able to collect tolls and deal with the bonds or figure out a way to keep this going until we have a new transition that we know that's gonna happen on time so we have a new system in place. And we made that decision with all the risks involved. And we came uh, when we came to you in October, we informed you at the time that we're now um, going through a uh, sole source uh, to a different vendor. But that process is gonna take months. But the good news is once we made that decision at the time, we knew that we have some issues. But I think at the time that was the best decision to make to keep the operation going. Go ahead. Thank you, son. Um, so we did make that decision. Uh, 
ETAN was able to deliver the I-15 portion, so they did it in two phases. I-15 was delivered in November 2020, and 125 was delivered June 2022. And that brought both systems together, so now we have a regional back office system. Um, we've come before, or Hassan has provided in his CEO report, some issues that we have had with the system. Andre mentioned the uh, 100 people that needed refunds, which we did immediately. We also had a DMV issue, which we took care of, but we are consistently looking and identifying issues in the system and resolving them for customers and, and literally for all of, for the system. I'm going to talk a little bit about how process, how it all flows together, and, and I will get into the 49,000. So roadside equipment, as I said, all the transaction is compiled there, date, time, place, how much the tow rate is. It's then picked up by the back office system. They try to post to an account if there's an account available, if they've read a tag. If not, that picture, they move on to another vendor to make sure that that license plate is correct. It all moves over to the back office system that then takes those transactions, posts them, takes the ones that have pictures, moves them over to the DMV to get identification for the registered owner of the vehicle um, to send a bill. After that, it, it's it, here's the, the best way I can explain what is going on that's not affecting customer balances, but is affecting the financial system. You buy a new vehicle, you're an account holder. You buy a new vehicle you forget to put it on your good your fast track account. You get bills in the mail. Most times you get bills in the mails from someplace that you know you're an account holder, you just throw them to the side because you probably don't address them right away. But as soon as you do and make that phone call, we move those transactions over to your fast track account. And we reduce all the penalties and the fees and we give you the account rate. All of that is happening in the system on your account. So your account balance is correct. We've done all of the, we can see in history, we've made all of the adjustments, but that does not translate over to our general ledger. So we are at an imbalance at that point. Our general ledger is incorrect. Your account balance or the account balance is correct. That is what the 49,000 is about. Those transactions that we manually reduce and we are manually doing that. So as we bring down the, take away the penalties, take away the fees, reduce down the toll. That's happening on the system. The customer can see it, we can see it. It's in the transaction history, but it does not feed over to the financial system. So that general ledger piece, when you, it's kind of hard to explain to people, you know, I'm, I'm a customer. It would be hard for me to understand how what I'm hearing in the news about 45,000 drivers, 45,000 accounts, how that affects me. It does not. It is basically in the general ledger. We just cannot, we can't move our, our information. We can't balance our books, basically. We have the correct information in the customer account. We do not have it on our general ledger. Fagan Consulting, we brought on to help us verify that the customer accounts are accurate. That is important. If we have, I mean, we're saying that and that it sounds good, but we want someone to verify that that's what the case is. In the 45,000, we have found that case to be true. There are 10,000 outstanding. We need, we want someone else to verify that that is the true case of those also. So we have Ron Fagan from Fagan Consulting on, and they did uh, some testing for us of the equipment. They not only did the back office side where you post the transaction, they actually did the road side too, just to check that. So Ron can talk a little bit. Ron, I'm gonna pass it over to you to talk about this slide. Did we unmute Ron? He's not unmuted. Can you unmute? Hopefully you can hear me now. Yes. Good. Uh, good afternoon, Ron Fagan, Fagan Consulting. Uh, very quickly about me. I've been in the toll industry for 26 years. 13 of those years were on the agency side, either as a deputy director or director of operations. 
I started Fagan Consulting in 2011, brought on partners in 2014, and we now have built it to 25 highly skilled transportation system consultants. We are a veteran-owned DBE firm to include certification in California. One of the things that Lucinda is speaking to that we did, we have a subconsultant in the San Diego area. She rode uh, with a transponder in her vehicle every possible combination of trip building, and then she repeated it with a vehicle with no transponder in it. All of those transactions posted correctly to your back office system. She has a TCA account, and all of those were transferred correctly to her TCA account. Now, that is a small subset of transactions, of course. At the same time, uh, we did a roadside audit on uh, SR-125, a pair of ramps, 9001, I believe. Those were over 2,300 transactions for each ramp. The contract requires that the contractor meet four key, the roadside contractor meet four key performance indicators. It has to detect the vehicle. It has to read a transponder. It has to put that transponder in the correct vehicle and it has to be able to take images of the license plate that are readable and usable. We did uh, an audit, submitted the report in December of 2022. It passed all areas except one, and that was vehicle detection, and it missed that by point, less than 0.5, less than one half of 1%. So in order to get correct transactions into the back office, the roadside has to be able to do the key fact, the key performance indicators that I just laid out. And for those sets of ramps, it passed with glowing colors, save one small area, and that is a very, very small minor defect. Thank you, Lucinda. Thank you, Ron. Well, thank you, Lucinda and Ron. And I guess one of the important factors of what we want to discuss today is the disclosures that we've done. And before I get into our external and independent auditors, I know we talk a lot about different audit functions. At Sandag, we basically have over 20 different types of audits done each year, whether they compliance audits, performance audits, reviews, agreed upon procedures. And obviously, we also have our independent auditor's office as well with, with Courtney. So th this particular audit that I'm talking about is probably the, one of the most important. That's the annual independent financial reporting that is done by an independent CPA firm, which is Davis Farr. Uh, Davis Farr, this is the first year of their engagement. However, they were our auditors five years ago, so they've audited all of the Sandag entities, which include Sandag, the source point, Argus, the commission, SR-125, all of them. So they're very knowledgeable about the agency and have audited SR-125. So when we were starting to pull our year-end financial report, we have a June 30 year-end uh, financials. We started to pull that data in about August. We noticed that as Lucinda mentioned and I mentioned earlier, there was some of the general accounting uh, ledger we're not reconciling to our customer accounts, specifically the deferred revenue accounts receivable. And so during the month of September, we worked really hard to try and reconcile those amounts. In fact, ETAN actually had their accountant come to our office working with them. Ultimately, we were able to narrow the uh, amount down to that $8,700 that I mentioned relatively insignificant, but again, as a back office system, you're expecting that you should be able to reconcile 100%. So at that point, we said we had better notify our external auditors, which we did in early October. At the same time, since I mentioned earlier, we have outstanding bonds. So it was important for us to call and talk to our bond disclosure council, which we did. And in fact, I talked to them just yesterday, just to let them know that uh, we'd be talking today. And if there was anything that changed, they said, absolutely not. If by chance your independent auditor cannot get your reports done by December 31st, which they are due, put in an unaudited set uh, as a report and also put the reason as to why you didn't have your financials done on a timely basis. But again, he recognized that we are collecting revenue. The cash is reconciled to the penny. The problem is just with this deferred revenue. So he's like, bondholders should not have an issue with it because bondholders are going to get paid. 
So again, we made the disclosures to our independent auditors, October 6th, the same time to our disclosure council. And then literally within a week, we came to the board at closed session and told you. So I think that's important just to know that we've done everything that we should and told the right uh, different entities, including most importantly, our board of directors. So I'm going to turn it back really quickly to uh, Lucinda, who will kind of talk to you about our longer term approach and how we have a great fix. Thank you. So we're expecting to come back and our intent is to come back in January to do a sole source with Deloitte and A to B. Right now they are doing a data assessment. It's a 60 day data assessment in the ETAN system to determine what we could migrate because we wanna make sure we can take over as much customer information as we can so customers are seamless to the system and they don't have an impact of us getting a whole new system and they have to do a whole lot of work just to get their accounts right. So we're, we'll, be, we'll be back in January for that. Deloitte and A to B are best of both worlds. Um, on one side, A to B does tolling in Europe, Portugal, the country actually Ray Major and I went. <laughs> well, I have to do it both ways. Ray, Ray Major and I went and we visited uh, A to B in Portugal. Not only do they do a thousand miles of tolling, they have all of the customer, I mean, you can pay tolls, you can pay your pharmacy, you can pay parking, all tracked through their system, reporting all there. Um, one of, it's kind of best in class. Ron's partner, actually, um, Fagan, his partner went to Portugal before we even went, and I just happened to call and he said, oh yeah, my partner said is the best one he's ever seen, and we've both seen many, many systems. So between A to B and Deloitte, which is a partnership, we don't get one without the other. We get the best of Deloitte. We get the best of A to B. Our customers get that surety that we know where their money is. They get the surety of understanding, here are all my transactions, and they have many different portals for the customer to come in and look at their accounts. So right now, we do... We don't have a mobile app. They have a mobile app. We, you know, we have, you can get us by email. They actually make it seamless for the customer to interact with us. You wanna hit next steps? Sure. So um, our next step is, as, as we mentioned, Jennifer Farr is here in the audience today. If you have any questions for her, but I know that her and her team are actually in our offices working on the year-end report. So I know it's not finalized, uh, but as soon as that has happened, we will give an update to you, the board. We'll also give you an update on the remaining 10,000 transactions that Fagan is reviewing, uh, the $8,771 that we're not balancing. Hopefully that will find the reason for that and we will update the board on that. And then again, lastly, we will provide an update on the migration of the data right now. Deloitte and A2B are doing the 60-day assessment. We'll be back in January with the sole source contract that you, pending your approval, we will move forward uh, with the migration. So with that, Chairwoman, that concludes our presentation and uh, we're here for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first Vice Chair. Second Vice Chair, I'm sorry. Um, I have a question for the um, external auditor that we work with. Good afternoon. Good My afternoon. Thank Jennifer. you. I guess, well, I just I have a whole bunch of people on the queue. Okay. Um, uh, could you uh, answer this question? And that is, did you get from staff all the information that you need in order to? conduct your work? Well, we just started our work uh, on the SR-125 part of the audit this Monday. So we're still, excuse me, I, my apologies. Um, so we just received the trial balance and the information that we need to start the audit this Monday. And as mentioned, our team's on site uh, this week, next week, and forever however long it takes to go through the documentation. So it's a little um, preliminary for me to be able to answer your question directly because we have not 
uh, completed our audit test work, we're still very much in the preliminary stages of our testing. But you received information from staff. There was nobody from staff saying, you know, like withholding anything. I mean, do you get, how is your relationship with our staff in terms of um, back and forth, receiving the information that you've requested? I'm not exactly sure how to answer that question. I can tell you that um, there was a delay in getting information to us, which is why we are starting so late, which is why we're starting on Monday. And at right now, we are still looking at all of the information. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, Mayor Krantz. Hi. Yes, thank you. Um, I appreciate the uh, presentation. I have uh, kind of, you know, as I see this, it's a, uh, it's a, there are two two issues. One is the accounting issue, which it seems to me that um, is being addressed. But to me, the other and perhaps most important thing is the contracting issue. We are a contract agency and managing contracts is the most important thing that we do. Um, as a city, we have kind of a hybrid system. We have a lot of contractors, street sweeping contract and other things, but we also have public works departments. So the city manager has to be able to do both, but Sandag um, and as a contract agency manages public dollars to the tune of billions, which is uh, pretty important to have a competent uh, contract management program. And as I listen to the presentation, one of the thoughts that occurs to me is that if the contract with ETAM was entered into um, in, in 2016, so let's say 2017, they got started, what was, were there, and they never met any milestones and we never signed off on, on them as a uh, at completing their work. Um, but I'm trying to assess how far back these particular problems with these anomalies posting, uh, you know, these, these charges being misposting, how far back, when did we identify that that was taking place? Is that a recent development or did that have, was that just ongoing throughout the 2017 to today? Now that's a great question. And I think that is where we as uh, management made the decision that we needed to make a change. We had had ongoing issues, operational type issues, the ones and twosy types of issues. But when we realized in the September timeframe that we were never going to be able to reconcile our books. That's why you buy software, is that they're supposed to be able to assist you. And although there had been delays, E10 had been performing. I mean, we've been collecting $50 million. there had been operational issues, no doubt. But I think the final determination was, if you can't reconcile my books, that just doesn't work. It's like when you buy QuickBooks off the shelf, you think that that's what they do. That's why we bought the system and it just couldn't do it. So it was at that point that we decided the contract is terminating as it is early part of the year. At this point, rather than extending it, let's move to a new vendor that can get us to where we need to be, as Hassan says, a world-class organization. And unfortunately, that software wasn't doing it for us. And so to be clear, the conversation about this software not really looking like it was going to be, I mean, there were some consideration long ago at the thought of ending the contract and you, the RFP process would take this long and then the transition would take this long and the decision was maybe we can work this out. Is that kind of how it went? Is that you were at that point hopeful that you could, could get this working? You said exactly what I would say. We were hopeful the whole time that as we kept working with them, yes, we always had what we call tickets outstanding with them to fix this, fix that. And ultimately they were doing that, but it was taking time. But the most important thing, especially from my financial perspective, listen to us say from a customer perspective, from a customer perspective, we were collecting accurately. From a financial perspective, I was collecting all the money that I need to ensure that I get my debt covenant ratios and everything in line. It was just a painful process and it shouldn't have to be that way when you have a vendor on board, but we together were working on getting there. As Lucinda said, she's been doing this for years and I always hear some of the horror stories. It's not an easy, simple thing to get a system up and running. 
I say to Lucinda, whoever figures it out one day is going to be a multimillionaire because if you can go off a shelf and buy a system, that's going to be ideal. But unfortunately, because we're also different and also complex, there's not one like that out there. But I can tell you, ETAN tried to their best of their ability. Our staff tried the best of their ability. And it was working. We were getting customers' accounts reconciled. We were getting paid. But ultimately, when it came to this accounting issue, it's like, this is time for us to move. So um, as I look at this, it, uh, I'm a little uncomfortable with some of the decisions. Um, you know, I probably would have preferred to be notified as a board with fiduciary obligations uh, sooner than we were. Um, it sounds like um, the accounting is is taking place and that um, in terms of the big picture, the amount that is currently unaccounted for um, is pretty small. So, um, you know, but, but this board's credibility is on the line in these sort of situations. And uh, we know that um, the, over the last few years, um, the board's credibility has sustained some blows. And so um, I'm looking forward to um, recovering from this one and uh, continuing to rebuild the reputation of this agency. And so I appreciate the work that you're doing. And I know that as a, as a whole, San Egg is currently in a transition period and I look forward to that transition continuing and uh, coming out on the other side of it with uh, a little more um, increasing our uh, the 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 regard the, that the public holds for this board. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before I turn it over to um, Deputy Mayor Keim, I think you know it's really important to me, and this is what I said to our. Um, I, I know that you're going to be presenting to uh, the office of OIPA um, after us, right? Um, the audit committee, I'm sorry. Um, it, it is extremely important that we set up um, systems in place so the, that that there are those when this, that, and when are we reporting to the board, right? Uh, because it, to me, it doesn't matter how much experience you have doing this. We have a fiduciary responsibility to the community and to... Um, our constituents to be able to say, wait a second, uh, it's time for us to to renew, to figure out if we need to look at the system and if it's not working, what do we do now, right? And uh, when do we elevate it, right? I mean, I, I know that there was a point where you said, okay, now this is when we're going to get there um, and now we're going to move forward, but I feel like um, it took a while to get there. And I think those are the kinds of things that as we are moving forward, we're going to have to think about what that looks like. And I, I feel that those are the recommendations that, um, that are, I would like to see our independent auditor look at uh, from a systemic uh, perspective to really give us um, some, some best practices because I do feel that that's how you build public trust. Otherwise, um, you know, making decisions based on how uh, things were done before um, can create some challenges for us as a board. So um, I, it's it's concerning, right? And um, and to hear the independent auditor uh, say that uh, they had not gotten the information, and so they're starting now, even though. In the conversations that I had, I was told that, so I, I'm really confused by her response right now because she just said that she had not received information and that's why she, they're not starting until next week, but they've been involved in independent auditor. They, this is how you got the information. So can somebody clarify that for me? Because I have been in briefings where I've been informed that independent auditor has been involved in this process from the beginning. So can someone clarify that for me, please? Yes, if I can, Chairwoman. So I think what Jennifer is responding to is we've been working on the year-end financial reports, the trial balance, the, the general ledger, all that information has been given to the auditors. 
And we, that's how you came, that's how you found out that there were some challenges. So when we notified the auditors back in October, yes, that is when we understood that there was an issue with the general ledger. And so in the meantime, we've been balancing the best we could. So I guess what I'm saying is we notified them of the issues that we were having okay. in our reconciliation and giving them the information this last Monday, I think we gave them some draft documents in the meantime, but the final reconciliations that we did, again, we're trying to give them the best work product we have so we're not continuing the re rechanging our financials. We're giving to them on Monday. And that's, again, we're giving them the reconciliations down to that, I keep going back to that $8,771 that we are unable to reconcile but our balance sheet income statement and all the information has been provided with that reconciling difference. All right, I'll come back. I'm gonna give my colleagues an opportunity to ask additional questions. Deputy Mayor Kime. Hi, so just a couple of quick questions again, as I um, rotated on the board this year. So we gave, uh, what I'm trying to understand, we gave ETAN the contract in um, 2017. That was that, how how much how much was that contract for? Like, do you have a ballpark? Not to exceed twenty eight million. Twenty eight million. Over, Were over they besides years. caps? I didn't hear the answer. So not to exceed twenty eight million. So besides caps, did we were those? Was it just caps should E ten or do we have any other consultants helping on on this to help us tr um, transition this? The, so back. we had H and T B. H H and T B. H and T B. Okay. And they were our technical support to what, the Sandac team. What is, what does that mean? That Just means briefly. That, oh, briefly. A total experience could give recommendations to our project manager. Okay. To go I, forward. So how how much was H and T B's contract? Um, we've had H and T B's contract. Um, amended a number of times, and I believe the amount on the E-10 contract was approximately $5 million and approximately $5 million on the cap side. So total 10? Correct. So so total, we're getting close to the $40 million on, on this for the last six, seven years, and just the numbers that you got? So we've paid um, uh, E-10 uh, $7.3 million. We've withheld a million dollars. We've paid HNTB five million on that particular contract. And with that, with HNTB, what so was their job essentially to make sure this was successful and we had an operating system that could accurately collect revenue? Is that was that what they were supposed to do? HNTB because they're the experts on this, right? They they are the experts providing advice to Sandag. Okay. And so what, six, what uh, were there? How long did they say? So when we gave them that initial contract, when did they say they get this up and running for us? They were not to get it up and running for us. That's what ETAN does. That's what CAPS does. Okay. They were there to support Sandag. Okay. So again, exactly what, what did H&TB do then? Because so, we, it's seven years later and we don't have a functioning system yet. So I'm trying to figure out what, what the $10 million did. I'll give a, uh, an example of just what we've been talking about right now, the 49,000 and the reconciliation. Okay. They actually have helped us on that. So not only was E10 involved in trying to reconcile, but H&TV brought their support to that also, but they're just support. The success okay. of the program is really on Sandag okay. and the vendor to provide the system. Understood. So I, I guess to catch us up to date now, where are we at? Because I, I read, I'm reading this and I hear some, um, in our staff report, I get some mixed language. I mean, if you go to the first page on a summary, you go down the fourth paragraph, last line says improvements must be made to the back office system. So are we just approving the ETAN system with a new operator or are we having a whole new system? Oh, we're having a whole new system. The oh, it's, oh, system so, we're replaced. Will, will so that's the confusing exist. part. Instead of it, so it sounds like it's just repairing this and we have a new operator. Oh, no, we will not have, we will have a new system. So so how much is that? And that's with Deloitte and A to B? And that's an, uh, we don't, well, they're doing the assessment now. Um, so their first uh, estimate was 28 million. So, and, that, and that's on top of the, so now we've, we've have, so after 40 million, we don't have, we don't have a functioning system and now we have to start all over. We're at 17 million. 
We're at five okay. million for uh, listen, HNTB that, on I fifteen. Go for it. The PT Mayor, I, I think it's a great question. Okay. We are going with the whole new system. Yes. Uh, ETAN contract runs up in February. We have some arrangement because there is a transition. We want them to be part of the transition. Once the new system comes in, and you're going to see next month probably a request, there will be about 28 million. But that's exactly the same amount we would have paid ETAN to continue on the same process. So it's nothing new on top of what we're paying ETAN. It's a replacement system that costs almost the same. So the replacement, so we don't have to actually buy new software that's going to cost us that Correct. for the capital? This, this is a because... whole new system, uh, uh, Deloitte with the back office A to B uh, as a team. Go ahead. That, that's, does that, that's accurate. So this, we, this is not costing us anything extra than it would have with E10. If, if E10 had continued, it's the same cost. This is not um, extra for us. I just want to confirm that. E10's was, there's 27 million. Right. I think it was your not to exceed, and we paid them seven so far. Okay, but I mean, the, I'm talking about the new one. So the, the new, new system, the new 28. Mm -hmm. This this having to change a whole new system is not costing us any extra money, is what? Correct. Mr. Is that accurate? Ms. Minus the seven million we've already put into E10. Mr. Yeah. So let me try summarize it the best I can. So the initial contract with E10 is 28 million dollars. Yeah. It's multi-year contract. So far, they've earned 8.3 million of it. We've withheld a million dollars. So we paid them $7 million. We're estimating that the new contract with Deloitte and ATB could be in the $28 million as well. So $28 million plus the $7 million that we've paid to ETAN would really be the cost of the software if we keep... Um, Deloitte and uh, A to B for the full term of the contract, because part of it is actually setting up the the software and then maintaining it for multiple years. Understood. And I guess, I mean, I, I still, I think we're forgetting about the H and TB, the 10 million, which is, um, I, I'm still trying to figure out what value or what, what we got when it's seven years later and we don't have a functioning system. And where is this, so when we go, where is this extra money going to come from? I'm assuming it's going to come from the toll roads, correct? Correct. This money will come from the toll roads. So, so those are the toll users that are going to have to pay for this, for this extra money. I, I, that's what I'm just going to want to confirm. That's correct. The toll users generally are the ones that are paying for the equipment and the software on the facilities. And, and how are we going to add that into the cost of the toll? Does it extend the loan, or how do we do that? No. Uh, fortunately, um, we have reserve funds. Uh, we've set aside capital accounts to pay for equipment software um so we're well capitalized for that okay. okay 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 that's it for now thank you all right um so we started discussion and i want to make sure that i follow process so if i have a couple of folks on the queue but i don't want to i want to make sure that the public is able to ask their questions and so we have a couple of folks that are in public comment so i'm going to turn it over and um i got to make sure that the clerk helps me to make sure that i don't i follow protocol so can you please make sure you call public comment first and then I'm gonna come back to my colleagues. I apologize uh, for jumping into uh, member comment. So go ahead. Our first public commenter, Alan C, please come to the podium. You'll be followed by Catherine Rhodes and then Truth. I really help. I really, really, I can't do this by myself. Thank you, Oceanside. So let me get this straight. State release funds to pay off the tolls earlier. And then we put new transponders, which he didn't talk about that cost in addition to 70 million. And the Caltrans freaked out because it said, well, that's gonna make more cars. No, let's read what it says. It says by putting in 125, we will reduce the infrastructure on 805, saving $265 million. Why don't you take that $265 million transnet that you did not use and pay the stupid toll off so we don't have to spend another $100 million for another guy collecting money. Pay it off now. You're going to get the trust back to the people in South Bay. And because right now nobody's using the toll because of all this mistrust, 45,000 drivers got overcharged. You want to restore trust? You want to restore confidence? Pay it off now. You've got the funds through Transnet that you didn't expand the freeways on, $265 million. I yield back. Catherine Rhodes, please come to the podium. You'll be followed by Truth and then Paul the Bold. Hello, Catherine Rhodes. I just want to mention... Um... 
Mayor Todd Gloria is not here. He never shows up to your SANDAG meetings. He has 42% of the vote on SANDAG, never shows up. And um, since I'm trying to manifest it, you could follow me at Mayor Rhodes at Facebook and Twitter. For this item, I think you should analyze if carpool drivers who are non-SANDAG customers without fast track transponders and are carpooling are getting illegal tickets on the I-15 while carpooling this summer. And um, um, one of my friends on, on, on Twitter mentioned repeatedly receiving bogus tickets from SANDAG for driving the carpool lane along I-15 with multiple occupants. Anyone have similar experiments? Any, know anything about the technology employed in the scam. Considering the tens of thousands dr of drivers in San Diego routinely paying false fines for these ill-gotten gains becomes a revenue source for San Diego. And so the solution is, see, is there a big giant increase in the amount of tickets um, being paid on the I-15 for people who are carpooling who are not your customers? They are not your customers. Your time expired. Thank you. Truth, please come to the podium. You'll be followed by Paul the Bold and then Mark. All right, are you running on hope, Andre? This is the most expensive toll I've ever heard. How much is that $8 toll gonna be now? It's alleged that $45,000 were incorrectly charged while Eton and HNTB consultants got rich. So who benefits while Sandag loses taxpayer money? Future lawsuits are gonna expose this toll corruption to everyone involved in it. But why wasn't ETAN dropped last year when problems were getting worse? And why didn't Fagan Consulting find discrepancies? They both need to be dropped. Sandag contracted with Cops Traffic Com based in Austria, exposing drivers' information to foreign leaks, now hiring UK-based Deloitte, who works with the CIA and the CDC, and has tons of controversies, including leaks. It's not going to be better. And these up to $386 charges to drivers by an electronic system should serve as a cautionary tale of what's going to happen in the future with A2B's electronic camera system for congestion tolls or crime that reads license plates. It's further proof of what Sandak offers people. Failures, inequitable tolls, and absolute corruption. Our next commenter, Paul the Bull, please come to the podium. You'll be followed by Mark, then Mike. Uh, hello. Um, a large number of transactions were posted to the wrong account, but it wasn't only your system. People, public people were affected. Um, the presentation did not say whether this problem is fixable in office, but simply goes on to recommend a new vendor and system. This sounds like it will cost more and risk more account errors. Sounds to me like the fix is in. Hassan, you knew about these issues a while back. Shame on you for not revealing them before or fixing them. How many people received error notices on their accounts or had errors in their credit accounts? Thank you. I'd appreciate an answer. Our next commenter, Mark, will be followed by Mike, and then B. Mitter Miller. Mark, they've sold rights to our roads to a private subsidiary corporation that is uh, making the, taking roads we built for ourselves and saying we can't use them. Rich people can use them. That is not equity and equitable. Um, also, um, this is already being done, uh, as only you know, the city doesn't know what you guys do here, that Sandag is planning, uh, has meetings planning uh, Oxford ULES meters that are being used in Oxford now uh, to, to uh, make it so people can't go on their own roads, and no gas vehicles in London right now. Most people don't know about this. Um, there's more pollution than ever now, and uh, it's it's absurd that it's being done in the name of climate change and global warming. Um, John Coleman, meteorologist of the year, stated it's a scam. William Happer, who's a real genius with unbelievable credentials, um, states that it's a scam. If you put in global warming, climate change, any of these names, William Happer, um, John Coleman, or Shiva Ayodhira. I'm inspired. B. Mitter Miller, please come to the podium. You'll be followed by Mike. Thank you. Um, 
This is obviously very complicated and uh, tangled mess that is being talked about. Um, what I would like to say is that um, toll roads, the way they exist now in San Diego, are taxing a very small portion of our population, which is inequitable. It's been talked about for years. Uh, when Mary Salas was on the board, she would speak about the inequity of it all. And I agree with that. Um, I feel like this system is is broken and it should be changed. Um, on November 3rd, I sent a copy of an op-ed that was published in the Union Tribune concerning road user charges to all board members. I hope some of you actually read that. Um, this is one system that could um, be a much better solution to what is happening now. Thank you. Thank you. Our next commenter, Mike, will be followed by Michael Brando. Good evening again. Um, yeah, this whole uh, whole road problem. Um, how do we build safeguards in that this doesn't happen again? Right, Mayor Wells, you like brought it to the forefront. Um, there was a an employee that blew the whistle, and to add insult to injury, you fired the individual. Wrongful termination, likely. Another lawsuit that's going to cost us taxpayers likely millions of dollars. We need to build safeguards so these so these instances don't keep repeating themselves. Yeah, I know you're probably really tired of hearing us talk to you, Hassan, but I'm so glad you're on your way out. Yeah, absolutely. You're garbage. You're a garbage human being, and don't let the door hit you where the good Lord split you. Our next commenter, Michael Brando, please come to the podium. You'll be followed by the first virtual, the original draw, followed by the final commenter, Blair B. Michael, I want to thank uh, Ryan Kine for asking some very relevant questions. I want to call out some hypocrisy on this issue. Nora just got through saying, that's how you build public trust. And then Master Gaslighter over there, Hassan, says the buck stops with me. Yet this is addressing basically what I was talking about earlier. There is no trust because there's all this manipulation of language and trying to obfuscate. And that's a word Bill Well used one time about what goes on here, obfuscate. And that is very accurate. I just did a cursory review and looked and saw that this A to B company is in, involved with multiple cities everywhere, not just in this country. And they're called uh, smart city players. And I've talked about 15 minute cities of city of San Diego and the County Board of Supervisors. The good news, the more you try to control people, the more out of control you get. Bless you, happy holidays. Our next commenter, the original draw, will be followed by our final commenter, Blair B. The original draw, please go ahead. Great comments for people. Um, yeah, if the state converts a right or a liberty into a privilege, the citizen can ignore the license and fee. You're taking the roads that are the people's roads, and you are usurping the people's right to use them freely. And not until you have litigation and you fire somebody for bringing this topic forward, that then you say, oh, well, we have to, you know, due to an article written or whatever, we got to let the people know about it. That's the problem is that you guys are so corrupt that you'll even fire your own for exposing your corruption and your inability to provide the people with any kind of cohesive, you know, anything. And, you know, you do this because you have to act like you're transparent, like, oh, well, we're going to do this now. Yeah, because you've been exposed and it can't wait for all the other things to be exposed, but it costs us money when you guys are so negligent. And Hassan, yes, don't let the good Lord hit you or the, or the door hit you or the good Lord split you. But, um, you know, these congestion charges with this point A and B, whatever it is, is already happening in New York. It's coming and you guys are, are really. Your time expired. Our final commenter, Blair B, please go ahead. 
Hi, uh, Blair Beekman. Uh, thanks a lot for this item. Um, I was kind of in favor of the toll idea at first. I'm not so much now. Um, I, I think I think it's an issue. Uh, thank you that you're trying to work out details. Uh, good luck to better address this issue in the future. And as I've mentioned, uh, to, to to address this issue and possibly uh, to, to, to reduce the concepts of toll uh, fares uh, as use, um, to also address tech accountability issues with this issue. Um, are you going to be able to have uh, open public policies to describe all the technology used for the tolls? Uh, I think that's an important concept to consider. We have ALPR use, possibly biometric camera use. We have to be learning how to familiarize the, that subject matter and that it can be accessible conversation for the public and it's not meant to be secretive and only for yourselves to know. That has to learn to be an open process. Good luck how we do that. Thanks. That concludes the public comments. You're out of order. So, all right. So, uh, the next person is Council Member Ed Scrubs. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll... Pleasure. Pleasure. A few moments ago, Mayor Krantz asked a question, and I'm going to paraphrase. He said, in 2017, how many issues have we had with the system? And I heard a term that I've never heard with accounting and it was onesie twosies, but then you obfuscated Andre and went off on a tangent and you never really answered his question. It was somewhat Nixonian. It reminded me of the debates the other night, ask me what you want, I'll tell you what I want to say. So I have a question for you. How many of these anomalies as you described them in the board briefing have we had and when did they begin? So in this sounds Nixonian, when did you know and who knew it? This seems to be a systemic problem from the onset. And so I have a compound question. So Lucinda, you mentioned the interface between the DMV and the system. Is that interface contingent on the camera system? If I don't have a transponder in my car, how does the DMV know unless the CHP stops me? I'll go first yes. and answer that question. So when we're capturing your license plate, because we do not have a tag in the vehicle, right? that license plate is what's going over to the DMV. Okay, so that license plate, if I'm just a scoff law, that gets reported and I would assume I get a bill or yes, correct. what if that car is registered to a transponder? Then that gets taken off of your account okay. because that way we know who, we know who you are. Have we had issues with the camera system not linking correctly or being inconsistent operation with the system that is failing us? The DMV issue that I mentioned? The DMV issue or the interface, absent the DMV, I would assume if the camera registers a plate, it would have that plate on file with the, the back office system and say, that's a permitted vehicle. Is that correct? That is correct. So have we had issues with that camera system not reporting correctly because the system is not working? Yeah, it's not. None of it. Because that would and be... my point of my oh, go ahead, please. I'll Consuelo, can you uh, make sure that you're not commenting uh, at this time? This is not the time for you to be making your comments. Okay, go ahead, ma'am. Yeah. So let me do two things. So the DMV and the issue that we brought forward was we were sending things to the DMV when the DMV was not available. So we were not getting information back about who was using the road. Okay. So that, so that goes to me then to a greater issue. We can account for people paying the toll on the 125 because there's a, a, a mechanism when you exit to pay your fee. There is no process for that on the 15. So if the system is not working and we identify a set number of violators or systems not being tracked, that assumes we're able to track those people that don't have a transponder in their car. So... I have a transponder, but I have half a dozen cars registered in my family's name. Do you know for a fact that I'm getting billed or do you know who's using the particular lane? Because I checked the bill and quite frequently it's not on there. And the first transponder I had wasn't debiting my account 
And when I finally got somebody to answer my question, the answer was, oh, that's being billed to the Golden Gate Bridge up in San Francisco. Well, fantastic. How does that work in our system? So we don't really know how many vehicles or users or trips have been unaccounted for if we don't have a comprehensive system that accurately tracks all aspects. Is that a fair assessment? That's a fair assessment. And okay. on the 15, we do not have violation enforcement. Okay. So we really don't know. We're looking at the 125 primarily here, and I get that. The 115 is, or the 15 is the white elephant in the room that no one's talking about because that is the bulk of express lane transactions. Is that a fair assessment? No, the 125 is is carries more traffic than the I-15. But, but how do we know that if we're not able to accurately track how many people are using it? Because we don't have a system in place that tells us how many, because if I don't have a transponder or I simply don't have an account and you can't interface either with the DMV or real-time tracking, you don't know who's been on there. On I-15, you don't need a transponder if you're a carpooler. Right, but my that, whole point being, the, there's no way to accurately track how many people are using it. That would be correct without visual. Okay, and, and a few moments ago, I'm switching over, Andre, you mentioned the differential between the existing contract and the contract presumably to come, and you gave us a dollar amount. Was that an accurate number? Let me clarify the best I can. So our initial contract that we had with E10 was for $28 million. That was for software delivery, and then it was annual maintenance contracts going out several years. We have paid to them um, $8.3 million, but we've upheld a million dollars of that. So the replacement system right now with Deloitte and A2B is going to be $28 million roughly again. We haven't finalized those numbers. We'll be coming back to the board. And so if I were to look at it from an accounting perspective, I would say that the amount that we have sunk with E10 is $8 million. But on the other hand, we have collected $50 million in tolls of them, so it's not completely sunk. But I guess from a apples to apples, it's like that $8 million has gone away, but we're not paying the maintenance fees going forward. So we're starting again, and we are going to be paying $8 million again to get software up and running. And then depending on the maintenance contract, I assume it will be about the same as ETANS. So that total contract could be $28 million. So out of all of what we've had here, approximately $8 million would be a cost that would have been sunk. And the same HNTB ETAN process is managed for the 125 and the 15? Yes, so um, we have two contracts with HNTB, one particular for CAPS, which is the roadside equipment, and the other one for E10, which is the software, and obviously they're on both both roadways. Okay, in, in the public report, it's mentioned liquidated damages. What are those liquidated damages, and how do they, what do they reflect? Could I ask Amberlynn to answer that question? Thank you, Amberlynn Deaton, Sandag Legal Counsel. Good to see you again, Amberlynn. Thank you. Glad to be back. Uh, the liquidated damages are a common feature of our consultant contracts, um, and they represent essentially what is the agreed upon amount of damages that the agency would incur in the event of delay. So when you think about liquidated damages, those are associated with delay in achieving specified um, milestones within a contract. Okay, so they are effectively a fine to the vendor for failure to produce. That's correct. It is essentially, in many respects, a penalty to the contractor should they not deliver the agreed upon terms so, on so the schedule we, that is agreed. So we fairly need to separate that out from the actual loss to Sandag for the trips on the 125 and the 15 that cannot be accounted for. So the the um, amount that Andre has mentioned, which is the um, 8.3 million, or excuse me, the 7.3 that has been paid to ETAN to date does not take into account any liquidated damages or any other damages that may ultimately be owed by that contractor. Right, so if we look at um, if we look at trips on the road as a service or a product, there's no way to, to, to reconcile the product loss because we don't know. 
We simply don't know how many trips were unaccounted for. We have money, and I think you used the term, Andre, the other day, the bucket and Lucinda as well. Money's in the bucket. And so we're paying down our debt on that with the money that comes in. But the break is the money's coming in. And if we can track it on a transponder, then we know that Andre or Ed paid that money. They went in, but we can't track the $3 that Ed paid to a ledger line that says this is Ed's debit. I get debited, but we lost that connection between the inflow and the tracking. Is that the problem we're having with this in that very small scope? Not the greater picture, which is we simply don't know how many trips have been given away. Is that fairly accurate? I would say no. Okay. What, what did I miss then? Because this, so, is, this is what I'm hearing from you. Okay. So I, let me explain it, uh, hopefully to be as clear as I can. So when a trip is formed on the road, CAPT captures the data, sends it to ETAN, ETAN software accounts for it. That is working well. And that's what Fagan confirmed. They did those 32 trips and they confirmed without exception, I think he said there was a minor, something that we're capturing all that. So that's working well. And again, going back to the history of the toll road, knowing the amount of traffic that we've generally had over the last 11 years based on the trips, my numbers account really well. That's a big 10,000 level uh, uh, view of it. I think the issue is when there is a manual entry. So if you forget to put on your new car onto the lane, then you realize and you call our office and you tell our office that shouldn't be a violation. They're like, oh, thank you, Mr. Ed. I'll take that off. They take that off. That is where the problem is because that's a, now a manual entry by somebody who's answering the phone, fixing your problem, but that is not going from the system correctly to the general ledger because it's a manual entry. And so that's what ETAN has actually told us, those manual entries, which are probably 99% of the problem here, as not being able to be tracked. And so our customer accounts were confident are accurate based on all that other testing we've done, but it's a manual transaction. Once somebody from the phone is answered with the customer, they've entered it, that's not flowing through to the back to the general ledger system. What is the time delay from either the transponder or the camera, the capture system to the account holder? Three to four days to move a transaction from the roadway over to the back office. Okay. I, I've used the 15 Express Lane without the transponder three times in the last week, and the last notification on my account was from late November. So I, I'm I'm just going to say colloquially that perhaps it's not working as we think it is, and it's the same software vendor. And now we're going to continue paying them as we transition to a new software vendor. Is that correct? The, without a, a clear, clearly defined time of when that new vendor will be online. I heard it was months. So the idea is this $1 million that we've withheld from the vendor that we will pay them over the next, we expect the migration to take seven to 10 months. Let's say it's 10 months. So this 10 months divide by a million, hundred thousand dollars a month. I think our goal is to keep the vendor engaged because obviously they're losing the contract. They're not going to be maintaining it. So we want to keep the vendor engaged. And we also want to make sure that they are as helpful as they can to A to, a to B during this migration phase. So um, can I ask, um, just for purposes of the focus of this particular item, um, council member, and I'm not trying to, um, I think your questions are extremely important, but can we focus on the issue at hand, which is the 125? I understand where you're going yes. because of the systematic issues that are at hand, which I think we should address. And I, um, and I, and I think that if you have very specific, you have very, very specific questions that you want to address related to the 15, but I think that because we want to, there's, I have a, a lot of people on the queue. Uh, I want to make sure that uh, we get to them. So are there any other specific items that you have related to the 125 and the issue at hand right now? Just a quick comment, and then I'm shutting down. Comments about trust and faith in the system. 
to me, they go beyond what we're dealing with with software vendors. A lot of questions are being asked today by this board and we're not getting clear answers. And we're only getting these answers now when there was a problem going back to 2017 and whether they're Wednesday, Tuesdays, doesn't matter. These need to be brought to the board contemporaneously and they have not been done. And that is my real concern is the openness and, and the tr uh, transparency that we talk about a lot to this board from this management team. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Wells. Do you say Wells? Okay. Hi, thank you for coming today. Um, so on October 31st, I sent in a list of 21 questions. You guys assume you're familiar with that. And I asked for the entire board to be CC'd on that. So I'm assuming everybody else is familiar with that. I never got an answer to those questions. And I assume that this meeting would be in answer to that because in my letter, I asked for this to be agendized on, the, on this date. And then I heard that it was being agendized. So I thought, okay, well, I'm gonna get my questions answered. But at this point, I uh, basically haven't been answered a question. What's the plan to answer my questions? Will that be in writing? How, how's that gonna happen? Um, I can ask maybe Amberlyn or John to respond to that question. I'm happy to respond to that. As I understand it, and please correct me if I'm wrong, Mayor, I think you would send 21 questions. Those were shared with all the board members and you asked that an open session item be agendized in order to answer those questions in front of this board. Not that you were expecting a written answer to them. I believe in response to that, the chair agendized this item and that's the scope of our discussion today. If any items okay. in your letter are not being addressed, please feel free to, to ask staff about those. All right, there's a lot of questions, but um... I'll go ahead and ask a few. Uh, so 1,600 days elapsed in the in liquidated damages. That's four years. Why did it take so long to discuss this? Because I think we didn't discuss it until mid-October. Why, why did the board not be made aware of that beforehand? Well, perhaps I could offer this, Mayor Wells. Um, once the board authorizes the entry of the uh, CEO to enter into a contract, contract administration becomes a function that is delegated to the CEO. And so this was delay damages and any associated liquidated, or excuse me, delay and any associated damages are, you know, part of the contract administration that is overseen by the CEO and staff. So just to clarify, what you're saying is the CEO made a decision not to share it with the board because at, under his prerogative. That would be within the CEO's authority, yes. It and let me just emphasize this. Sure. I, I made all the decisions, uh, not in 2017. I wasn't here in 2017 and wasn't here in 2018 either. But uh, since 2019, I made all the decisions, but it was never a decision to not inform the board or come to the board. You, you hire your staff to do their job and we were doing our jobs and we knew there were issues. And when we needed to come to the board, we came to the board. Uh, and so, uh, the, as I said in the beginning, the buck stops with me. I made the decision, and I think um, I will stand by the decision we made. It's not the fault of the consultant or the vendors. It is us who was having oversight. And like being mentioned before, I, I agree with um, Mayor Grants uh, from Encinitas. Yeah, we, we knew there were some operational issues, but we thought the best approach is to overcome them until to get to the point where we couldn't get a financial statement. That's when we came to you in October. But yes, I made those decisions based on the authorities you offered me to make. And I don't think you want every time we have a opera small operational issue, I mean, this is a, a big operation, so $1.3 billion budget. That's why you, you want your staff to manage this. But Trust me, that was never an intent or never be intent to hide from the board any information or from the public any information to that matter. I can't speak for the entire board, but I can tell you myself, I'd want to know about these kind of things. And I think that these are the kind of problems that the public worries about. They, they worry about the, the board not getting all the information it needs to get to make informed decisions. So um, and that would be something I'd like to discuss at another, another time. Uh, as far as liquidated damages uh, that ETAN is responsible for, how many dollars is that? Uh, 
My, my recollection off the top of my head, I can reference my documents if I had a few moments, is that is currently approximately 5.4 million if you take the per day penalty times the 1,600 approximate number of days of delay. So is there a plan for them to pay that $5 million back to us? Not at this time, but I, I want to be clear that the delay is the liquidated damages continue to occur on the contract. So we are still in the middle of administering that contract. The liquidated damages provisions continue to apply and are currently accruing. Typically, at the end of a contract, for any contract, not just this one, uh, at the end, the completion of the work, when the deliverables are are final, that is when the agency would essentially, you know, address any liquidated damages and true and true up a contract if needed, or pursue those damages if needed. So we're we're just not at that step yet. Okay. What we the action that we have taken to date is, as Andre mentioned, to withhold from amounts that have been owed for different um, milestones that the consultant has. Has achieved. We have withheld certain amounts um, from that consultant, which is permissible under the consultant's contract. So, but isn't it true that this company will likely go bankrupt? I couldn't tell. I, I couldn't tell you. Okay. And if they do decide to declare, declare bankruptcy, what happens to our liquidated damages? Uh, well, it would be a legal right that the agency has not waived and still holds. Um, there are additional provisions in the contract regarding insurance, regarding sureties that the agency could consider pursuing at some time. What's uh, HNTB's responsibility? Uh, I think it's, um, as Lucinda mentioned and Andre mentioned, HNTB is a technical consultant to the agency. They are tasked with providing technical support um, with, that is within the scope of their contract for the agency. So HNTP was giving technical support to, to ETON? No, HNTP provides to technical support to SANDAG project managers, not to the consultant itself. Okay, so was HNTP ever linked to ETON in this project? They are linked to ETON in the sense that they provide technical support to the pro this internal Sandag project managers who are tasked with overseeing the work of ETAN. But as far as any sort of like contractual link, no, that would not be the case. Okay, so so my understanding is that they were a project manager that they, they were involved in hiring ETAN. Is that is that not correct? Am I am I wrong about that? Uh no, ETAN was was hired, you know, hired or retained by the agency after a competitive procurement process. Okay. And then if the HN was not involved. I want to make sure we have a very clear record. I do believe that HNTB assisted our procurement staff during the procurement process, again, as a technical expert to our staff. So they were involved to some extent, I believe, in the procurement of ETAN. They, were, they were not, vein. they were not, let me be clear, yes. They were not involved in this, they were not one of the evaluators involved in the selection of ETAN. They provided technical support services to support the procurement process itself. So is, then it would be fair to say they have zero culpability in, in this in, instance? I don't know that I would make a conclusion that large to be, to be perfect. I wouldn't honest. say that about <laughs> any consultant that is involved in this. All right, just out of curiosity, how, how, uh, how many contracts does Zeton have with us or the percentage of our contracts? W w w do you have any, does anybody have any sense of that? Or I'm not ETA, I'm HNTP. I don't, but I could get that information to you relatively quickly. I like that information. Um, so, so since it wasn't clear, uh, and I apologize for, for being unclear in my letter, I would like to request a, uh, a written explanation for the questions that I asked. I think as a board member, I have a, a right to ask those questions. And I, I certainly think there'd be other board members that would like to have that information as well. And I would also like to formally suggest that we go for, we discussed the, the possibility of an independent investigation into this. Um, perhaps everything about this is completely above board, but I don't believe that the, that the public has the confidence us at, in us any longer to make that determination. And certainly to, to just tell them, there's nothing to see here, don't worry about it, we're, we're gonna handle this. We're gonna have our independent auditor or our internal auditor to take care of it. I think we need a completely independent auditing firm to come in, not just look at the processes, but also look at the at all the other aspects of the political aspects of this, the uh, every, every aspect of this and come back and give us a, a full recommendation. 
That is my recommendation to the board, and I, I ask that that would be agendized at a future meeting so that the board can can vote on it. So, Mayor, Thank I you. actually take, um, um, you know, I, I um, we will do our best to respond to every one of those questions, uh, ensuring that there is, um, you know, there is clear uh, legal parameters about what we are, you know, we're, we're in a process of, of um, parameters of how we respond to some of this because of, of the legal, what was, what's the best way to respond to that? Any legal implications. Any legal implications of some of that, right? Um, but I take, can you give me a second? Thank you. Uh, but I take offense to anyone saying that, um, that there is no transparency or that there is, listen, it's my turn to speak. I'm not speaking. Well, that this board is not taking this seriously and that people are out there in the news saying that, that we're not, that we haven't followed process, that we're not investigating, that we are not doing our due diligence. I take offense to that because We are. There's an independent auditor that has been uh, starting a process. We're also doing our due diligence with our um, independent auditor, right, that we have, that all of you hired to do this process, and that is going to be moving forward with that. We're going to make sure that everybody is, is uh, doing their investigation the audit committee is going to be presented with their information as well. It is going to be the number one priority for our interim uh, CEO as well. And so, you know, to say that there is no interest from this board to, to actually move forward and that we don't care and like all this stuff, I really take offense to that. And so I just want to put it on the record that the chair of SANEG, and I know my colleagues who unfortunately had to leave, uh, who are in leadership of this board, we have been very concerned. I have been actually meeting with this leadership team uh, continuously to make sure that I ask the tough questions. I've also made sure that I've met with our independent auditor. And so I just wanna make sure that I put that on the record. I don't know what political games people want to play around this stuff. I don't care. I don't need to be on TV to talk about this stuff. I'm just letting you all know that I take this very seriously. I take my role very seriously. And to me, it's extremely important that people know that we're going to make sure that this is fixed. I take the 125. I live in Chula Vista. And I make sure that I am paying attention to this because it impacts my constituents and it's in a very important issue for me because it actually impacts my constituents in Benita, in Chula Vista, in Otay Mesa. It impacts my constituents directly. And so for me, this is not something that I'm just reading about in the paper. The toll road and what the impacts are in here is actually going to have a huge, huge impact on us. So. This is, we have a plan, right? Can you put back uh, the, the recommendation that we have in the timeline about what we want to do? This is an information item right now. And so to say that there is no interest in this board to move forward and do, uh, take steps on what we're doing, I, I find that very offensive. So with that- I'd like to respond to those accusations. You just said that right now. Can I, can I respond so, to the accusations? No, sir. Uh, I didn't say the things you said That's I said. What I heard you say, so, sir. That is not what I said. Okay, and, fine. and I think my obligation to the public is greater than my obligation not to send you. Council Member Shu, is your time to speak? Thank you, Chair. I want to first start off by saying let's remind ourselves that 125 was a private toll road originally, and that Sandag bailed them out because they were going under. It was not working, and Sandag made the road work. Otherwise, it we wouldn't have no 125. Because Sandag did have to 
purchase it, it had to go into um, debt. And so we essentially have a, a bond process to pay off that debt. So let's keep that in mind. It was Sandag that made, made 125 still operating. Otherwise, it would be a, a piece of rubble. I have some uh, other quick questions. Andre, you mentioned that essentially we're collecting enough money, all the money that we think we should be getting from this toll road. Is that correct? Yes, based on the right. historical it, trips we're collecting. So we it's a matter of reconciling uh, a number of problems uh, in, with the general ledger. Correct. And you mentioned you gave the figure of 8,700. Is that correct? That's correct. As a percentage of the amount, what percentage is that? It's less than 0.001%. I did some math. There's a lot of zeros after <laughs> yes. in terms of percentage. It's far less than 1%. And I challenge any of you from other cities and local entities to have that kind of accuracy with your, with your accounting system. Jennifer, I have a quick question for you. You're doing an audit of these systems. Is that correct? I'm doing an audit of the financial statements. Correct. And you're going to come back to Sandag with a report at some point. And I know some of the information is not getting to you as timely as you would like. At such time, will you be able to report on the timeliness, accuracy, and, and of audit itself? The audit report itself will comment on whether or not the financial statements are free of material misstatement. So you mentioned uh, percentages of revenue. So for example, uh, the financial statements will be able to express an opinion about whether or not the financial statements contain a material uh, error. Sure, I understand that. I'm asking that at that time, can you comment on the timeliness of you receiving information or, or cooperation with SANAG staff in terms of you getting that such information? Normally, audit reports give that kind of comment. The audit report does not ha does not have nor require that type of information. Can you give it that is, anyway? Can you give us a report? Uh, it is back? not not something that we will be testing, nor are we. But if you have, to. Oh, let me ask another question. If you have difficulty getting information, would that deter you from doing the audit? Yes, if we cannot get the information we need to complete the audit, it would and keep would, us from expressing an opinion. That, correct. Yes. Thank you. Um, Council Member Shu, what if uh, one of the priorities is that we actually asked our interim CEO at her first report on January 12th to come back? So we have next steps up here, and we ask her to actually put a timeline to this that includes um, much more detail, because this is pretty broad. And this could be six months. It could be a year, right? Yeah, right. So no, I'm just, I'm just making sure that and the accusations have been made. I just want to know. Yeah. Uh, uh, I guess for the public and for other board members, we have checks and balances in our system, and we're going to know more of what what uh, is going on. Uh, we also have an independent auditor as well that can oversee this as well. So I, I'm, I'm kind of leery of Mayor Wells' initial proposal that would go to outside uh, report, and I don't know if we need that uh, at this point. Um, I think that's the, the main point. Uh, the, uh, let me make one last point. On October 13th, this board had a um, closed session in which much of the information that was reported today was given. The difficulties with uh, the auditor, um, not the audit, but uh, with the contractor uh, was told to us and the reasoning why it was a closed session and we had to be careful going forward so that we could retain data and information with the current contractor. So I'm a, a, a bit uh, dismayed that um, some members of this board are pretending like we didn't know anything about it. We did know something about it and we were also informed of why it was going the way it was going uh, in terms of timing and why it needed to be confidential at that time. Um, yes. We would all like more information sooner. I don't know if we need to know everything uh, that this organization is is, is uh, having difficulty with. I think that would be a long list. If those issues are, are important and if it's more than a certain amount, I, I think probably uh, we should know about it. I like that idea that we put some limits on that. Otherwise, we're going to be inundated with a lot of details uh, that is not um, I don't think it's necessary for us to correctly manage this organization. Uh, so again, um, oh, one last point, Lucinda. Um, you had mentioned that we have some 
issues with regards to, I hate to say, but um, I hate to go back to uh, I-15, but I am bothered that those people who are carpooling are not, may not be uh, correctly charged because that does affect how we deal with these managed lanes. So I hope we, we do look into that and address that customer service issue. Um, but I'm happy that, that you are working on customer service issues and resolving those on the 125. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Duncan. Thank you, and, and I'll try to be brief. Um, oh, go ahead. Give me one second. I'm sorry. I apologize for that. I'm going to do a time check. It's almost 2.30, and um, I have a couple of people on the queue, so I'm going to ask if you can all be very brief uh, because I don't want to lose quorum, and so I'm going to be um, calling. This is an information item, and so I um, am going to probably be closing up this uh, pretty quickly, okay? Yes, ma'am. You can remove me. Thank you. Preliminarily, I, I want to make a comment, and you can you know respond if, if you'd like. But and I'm not sure if this was part of the chair's confusion earlier, but I had some confusion. I'm not trying to say this was intentional, but after we spoke on the phone the other day about this matter, I took from what you were telling me that the external auditor had looked at this situation and had developed a level of comfort regarding it that should give me a level of comfort. And then, and again, I'm not saying that's intentional. That is definitely what I took from it. And when she came up today, she looked pretty uncomfortable and she said, we're just getting started. I, feel free to respond. I'm not trying to put you overly on the hot seat, but I'll move on. But I just want to tell you that was a confusion issue for me. No, I appreciate it. And, I, and I'd like the opportunity to respond to that. And I just want to take my time because I think it's important for all of us to understand. June 30 is our year end, and generally it takes a couple months for us to get all the information for the end of the month. So August is when we started pulling all this information. That's when we first noticed that we were unable to reconcile certain accounts, the deferred revenue and the accounts receivable because of the issues that I've noted. In the month of September, we actually had ETAN's auditor come and sit with our staff to try figure out why we couldn't make those reconciliations. We realized by the end of September and even with ETAN's management on the line saying that you will probably not have your year end books reconciled on a timely basis based on the manual entries that are happening. That is when I elevated it to my executive team, including Hassan. And that's when we decided that we needed to go to the board on council and disclosure council and our external auditor. It's on my calendar, October 6th, on a Friday that we called and Jennifer, along with, I think it was her manager, her senior, was me. It was a um, couple of our seniors that we just talked. Just wanted to give you an update, Jennifer, that this year we're having difficulty reconciling our SR-125 records. So we made that notification October 6th. It's a, it was a Zoom or Teams meeting that we had. We then came to the board and told them the same information on, I believe it was October 13th. Um, and in the meantime, since then, we're still working with E10 and actually HNTB and our staff to reconcile the best we can. I know I gave a bunch of numbers today, 90,000 customers, 55 initially were impacted down to 45 and the, the figure of 8,000. That's what we've been working on. I believe we've given in a couple draft statements to the external auditors, but as of Monday, that's when we realized that the best we can reconcile is down to that 8,771. Again, in my opinion, it's not material. That's for the auditors to determine based on their audit threshold materiality levels. But we gave them the information on Monday. Trial balance, balance sheet, income statement, along with the deferred revenue reconciliation down to that 8,700. So we've given them all the information at this point that we had. It's taken a while because, again, auditors don't like to receive information back and forth, back and forth. They want to get the best information they can. And that's what we provided to them on Monday. I, okay. I think I understand that and understood that. But again, I stand by what I said. And I also took 
from you that the external auditor would be here and be able to answer questions for us and provide us additional comfort when in reality there is no reason for her to be here today because she has zero information to provide i don't mean that disrespectfully ma'am i mean that you know that you haven't done your audit yet right so anyways i will move on and i will leave that to others to to discuss further if they decide they want to um one other thing why this is a difficult subject to understand is because to me if I have a member of the public ask me about it, I want to be able to have an easy common sense explanation that I can give them after I've distilled and reviewed the information. So on one hand, yes, your comments about, oh, it's only $8,000, we've corrected the accounts. That is easy to understand. That is easy to tell them. $5 million of liquidated damages that is said after two hours of hearing, that's not easy to explain. And I have a third financial concern which is, I believe when we spoke, you told me, or I asked you, correct me if I'm wrong too, because I definitely don't want to say something that's not, not accurate, that I said, how much has Sandag lost from having the toll readers down? And I know some of that is older, and some of that has been in some of our independent auditor um, reports or alluded to or discussed before my time, because I'm just finishing my first year here. But I thought your response to me was there was at least a million dollars in tolls that were not collected when the when the readers were down. So again, if if we're kind of sending out the message to the public, hey, you know, it's we're down to eight thousand dollars, we're going to fix it. It's an internal thing. But then, hey, we have five million dollars liquidated damages. We didn't collect at least a million dollars worth of tolls. It's a very different picture. So I, again, I, if any, of the, if you want to have any comments or corrections on anything I've said. Yeah, just the, the $1.8 million is the amount that our independent auditor, when they did the investigation, thought that's the amount that we may have lost when the toll readers went down. But everything else you said was accurate. Okay, thank you. And, and I'll just make my uh, final comment in response to one thing that the chair was saying. I do believe you're taking it seriously and that the staff and the executives take it seriously. But I do think it's fair for me to be able to answer a question that I've, that I've stated here as a concern to me, which was that I do feel, when I have felt and I have said, um, that the last time our independent auditor reported that I did think it was not appropriate to put it at the, at the end of a five-hour meeting after we had a long breakout sec sec uh, session and workshop and that I'd requested, and I don't know if that got to, but I'd requested in the future with an independent auditor report of, serious nature that we should have that at the front of an agenda and make sure that everybody's here and that all the all the leadership is here and even if that didn't affect the seriousness of it i think it could have appeared that that's not taking it seriously so that's my only comments i've made so i'm, I'm not sure if you're referring to others but um i hope that that's the case going forward and then my last i do want to say one last thing chair when i look at this slide the one thing i do not see on here is the update of any findings by our internal auditor. And I do, I'm very happy with that hire. And I think um, that I would like her to be involved and I would like to have an up update from her, not just the external, because the external doesn't cover the other issues I'm referring to. Thank so you. a couple of reasons for that and, and a couple of things. Number one, um, I try to move this sooner. We had some, uh, because we were hiring a new uh, interim uh, CEO, we had to do the agenda the way we did it uh, today, number one. So it is what it is, unfortunately. Um, but the next steps, uh, the reason why I'm asking that we actually come back with a timeline, because I do believe that it's important to share with the public what the next steps are going to be with this particular matter. And we should have a fact sheet. And I'm, gonna, and I'm asking uh, our interim uh, CEO to come back and report back to the public at our January 12th meeting, what that is now that we've heard from um, our uh, executives today, the board has heard, uh, and then you have our internal auditor. And then uh, the recommendation that I have is that we also have um, our uh, other internal auditors. It's just confusing, right? Because we have our external auditor, and then we also have our internal auditor, which is um, Courtney Ruby, who I met with, also be included in these next steps. She was not on here uh, before. I wanted to bring that forward to the board and ask. I don't like making decisions and just saying this is 
what I think, I wanted to bring that to you, all of you, get your thoughts on it. And if you all agree, then uh, include it in this uh, recommendation so that I can make that recommendation to our interim CEO. Then we have a plan and that plan is presented to all of you at the January, if everybody's okay with that. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I just want to make sure that I was clear. I'm, I know today's meeting evolved the way it did, and it's our last meeting of the year, and I wasn't necessarily criticizing this meeting whatsoever. Yep. I was just referring to the last independent auditor's report. Okay. Thank cool. you. All right. So if everybody's good with that, I'm going to make sure that the uh, the that Courtney Ruby, our interim, uh, I mean, that our, I can't even speak anymore, that our uh, independent auditor, performance auditor is also included in this process. Okay. All right. And then uh, council member? Me? Last but not least, thank no, you, no, Chair. No, no, people after Okay, you. quickly, I had three questions. I'm going to whittle it down to two because I think one of them is similar to what Mayor Wells had asked of us. Um, we, when we're talking about ETOM participating in the migration of data uh, from the existing system to the new system to minimize impacts to customers, how can you ease my concerns that... Uh, Everything I said. Migrating data with E10 because I'm really less than enthusiastic, uh, enthusiastically confident in that business to to really make this happen. And how do we know they're not over there hurriedly purging records left and right that they don't want us to see? It's a business decision, and I honestly think E10 realizes it's in their best interest to get us to the finish line. There is no reason at all for them to withhold our information at this point. I know um, Council of has talked about the liquidated damages that we have. We have other um, items that we can go after. So honestly, I think it's in their best interest. And they have cooperated very well with Deloitte and A2B over the last six weeks that we've been working, or four to six weeks that we've been working together. So I think it's in their best interest and ours to get to the finish line here in hopefully the next 10 months. Thank you for that. And, and my last thing is that um, we've been talking today, whether it's, you know, 28 million, 38 million, we're almost 40, now we're up to 70, whatever the number is going to end up being. At the end of the day, I just wonder how the ratepayers are actually benefiting for the 125 toll road. What are they seeing in return for, for that toll? Well, I can tell you that, you know, some of the... Um, the A to B is going to have a lot more customer-centric um, items that are available. Listen, they can talk about some of them. They literally AI-related. Um, they saw the system in operation. So I think it's going to be easier. There's going to be more accessibility. I don't know, listen, if you want to just mention a couple of those. Well, that was really good. So AI, mobile app, um, what, do, what do customers get that they don't have now? They get access stability because right now we sometimes have performance issues so they get stability with the system they'll be able to see their transactions they don't have to call us so there's more self-service items that we'll be getting but technically they'll be able to it's, it's almost like we even will be able to know that the information that's inside of that system has been checked and is accurate great thank you those are my questions Thanks, Chair. I'll be real quick. So in the materials, it talks about 45,000 transactions. Are those the ones that you discovered just in August and that type of thing? Or is that over the, the term of we've been doing business with Eaton? No, I, so just so I can get the, the numbers correct. When we started initially, we were off by um, a total of 55,000 transactions that were 87,000. Okay. dollars and then ultimately we reconciled 45,000 of those that equated to 78,000. All right so the, I guess my question is the 55,000 when did those become apparent just this year when you started closing you were looking at or was that it was that previous years? No 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 this was just this year this was in probably the September time period that we've been working through the reconciliations and as Jennifer mentioned when we gave them the final um back up to the trial bans income statement, we were down to that uh, $7,000, uh, $8,700. So, so Eaton really just has failed in the last year. Is that is that reasonable to say? Or I know they haven't delivered, but perhaps they've the failure of they're not delivering has become apparent in the last 
a uh, few months, or is it? No, that the that's a great question, and we made the switch to Etan software for SR125 in May of last year. So it's only been this last fiscal year that we've had to use their numbers for the audit. Prior year was the old legacy system that we were using. So this is the first year that we've actually used their financial reporting. Okay. And, you know, for me, the real takeaway is that, you know, all said and done, there's lots of concerns uh, in my briefing with, with Andre and the team. You know, my biggest takeaway that was positive is the people who issue our bond rating or a pretty substantial amount on this especially on the 125, they were okay with what was found. And, you know, so again, I, I, I look at stuff like that when the professionals say, hey, you've done due diligence, you, you did everything you could do, we're okay with this because the, the bond ratings is pretty important. I know that in the city of Imperial Beach, we, we focus on that a lot. And so, you know, for that, I'm grateful because it sounds like we're worried about public opinion and that's very important to all of us. But the truth of it is, it seems like the people who, who would minimize our bond ratings or some of that, the professionals seem like they're okay with what the action has been taken. I think it's been diligence. Um, and I think we've learned a lot going forward. And uh, I don't I don't expect to repeat in this arena, but you know, there's lots of things that go on in Sandag that we can learn from and apply it there. Yeah, unfortunately that's not what's being reported in the news. The A plus rating is not what's being reported in the news. So, you know, it is what it is. Council Member Chavez. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you. Um, for taking the time for that uh, very detailed, detailed presentation. I must highlight as a representative for, for the city of Chula Vista, I must highlight that many, many of our constituents, uh, the users of this uh, Chula Vista residents, uh, visitors and businesses that would benefit from further transparency. I too agree that the, uh, to encourage confidence in the road and independent audit appears to be an appropriate request. And I would encourage Sandag uh, to undertake every every measure necessary to resolve ongoing issues with this road um, and restore the, and strengthen the faith in our users. I do want to point out, and not to derail from this very important topic, but I want to mention that the Sandak Board of Directors for, uh, and thank the Sandak Board of Directors for unanimously adopting a resolution in July 2022, prioritizing the elimination of debt and toll only operations on State Route uh, 125 early 2027. Um, and, and thank the California State Legislature securing 20 million from the state uh, designated toward reduction of outstanding bond balance on the SR-125 found. Fund. Uh, and it is my understanding earlier this year, Sandek received those funds which have decreased the forecasted gap uh, between outstanding balance and cash on hand by fiscal year 2027. Uh, and I'm just, I just have a little uh, a question and for future discussion as well, um, not in this meeting. Um, is Sandek holding the 20 million in a restricted reserve or accruing interest for further assistance in debt repayment? I, I do want to mention this because while we're talking about the 125, uh, my constituents and the city wants to know this moving forward as well. Um, additionally, I would like to know the status of the resolution directives adopted by the board last year, specifically a, pan, a plan to repay the outstanding debt uh, by 2027. And that is all for a future meeting. Thank you. Can I answer the one question that, yes, that money has been received, the $20 million, and it's currently sitting in a restricted account specifically for paying off the debt service for SR-125. All right, with that, thank you for uh, the opportunity to really have this really, really thorough discussion. I think it was extremely important. I, uh, I believe that our new uh, interim CEO uh, has clear direction from our board to make sure that this is your first, uh, uh, yes, uh, but we have full, full, uh, what is it called? Um, confidence in you to be able to come back with a plan and solve this. No, I'm just kidding. I mean, well, I, I do believe that that uh, we are headed in the right direction. We have our external uh, auditors and then we have our internal auditor as well uh, and a team that understands how important this is for us as we continue to build trust uh, with the public. And what, uh, you know, my priority is to make sure that we continue to to ensure that the public knows what the next steps are. And so let's make sure that we that we are uh, keeping. 
over communicating, I think is key and ensuring that everybody knows uh, what we're doing. So with that, um, the next board of directors meeting originally was scheduled for Friday, December 22nd at 9 a.m., but that has been canceled. The next scheduled board meeting, a board of directors meeting is scheduled for Friday, January 12th. Um, at 10 a.m. Chair, I'm sorry to interrupt. We do have some additional public comment left over from the beginning of the meeting to oh, take okay. before we adjourn. So, okay, so let's go ahead and do that. Thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna call first Paul DeBolt to come up to the podium and Paul will be followed by Consuelo. Um, how many minutes do you have? Uh, you should give Consuelo two minutes uh, to make up for not being able to speak on the last item. I'm um, holding three consecutive closed sessions at the beginning of the meeting, reeks of disrespect for people who give their time to participate in the public process. Uh, the California Constitution says the people have a right of access to information concerning the conduct of the people's business and therefore the meetings of public bodies and the writings of public officials and agencies shall be open to public scrutiny. If you, are, if you have several finalists for CEO, we should know who they are and be able to tell you whether they're outstanding candidates or whether they have black marks against them, which you may not have noticed. You should be honored to have all of our free advice. Thank you. And uh, again, Thank happy Thank you very holiday. much. Your time has expired. Uh, Consuelo, if you'd like to step up to the podium, you'll be next. And, Consuelo and for the record, uh, there was only one closed session today. And after Consuelo will be truth. People can only meet you at the depth in which they have already met themselves. That being said, there's nothing more offensive than hearing Nora say how this is her favorite month, because guess what? There are plenty of San Diegans who hate this month due to all the stress and demands that comes with it. They simply can't afford enjoying the holidays in San Diego anymore. You are so out of touch. Again, I want to urge San Diego to get involved because the majority well, some of these out of touch public servants do not care about the people. They only care about being federally compliant. While they enjoy their cushy lifestyles, they want you to turn down your thermostat, stay within 20 miles of your home and eat insects for the holidays. Happy Hanukkah. Our next speaker will be Truth, and after Truth will be Alex Wong, if you're still in the meeting. Um, if not Alex, then we'll go to Blair Beekman. All right, did you guys realize what it took to get your attention this year? A Star Wars video. Now it's time for everyone's end of year evaluation. The vote machines remain as reliable as public transit. Rebecca never ran out of questions while Ryan talked way too much. I loved Luz's passion and I want you to stay here. Terry was all numbers and actually very unforgettable, Hassan. Minto's chair will break soon because he leans far back like he's in a rap video. I was glad Raquel actually took that useless mask off so everyone could see her beautiful face just one time. Uh, Jack Davis shoe let us know that we're all gonna die from driving alone while he drives a bike while not looking both ways. While the other Jack did his best to keep the peace. Ray had way too many reports. Duncan, don't be afraid to fire up more. Tony, I'm waiting for you to smile more. Steve was as quiet as a cowboy mouse. Raul filled in Todd's gap like slurry seal. Katie said there are colonial fortresses without realizing she's actually on the board of one. Hassan had entertaining tantrums almost worth his inflated pay scale. I guess Nora kind of did too. And many people here admitted, thank Tons you very much. Cheese. Your time has expired. Our next speaker will be Blair Beekman, and after Blair will be the original draw. Blair, you can go ahead. Hi, the thing just showed up, the mute button, thank you. I feel even with some new current national security concerns at the local level, 
uh, in this country at this time. It is hopeful that for the most part, it seems the County of San Diego and local US communities want to continue to work towards peace, open democracy, accountability, and our better human ideals at this time and over the next few months. Uh, a reminder that some of our, our better human ideals at this time can include reimagine health and human services and tech accountability. This is local US communities working collectively to continue ideas of openness and positive sustainability at this difficult time of war in Israel and Gaza. And from this important good ways, the US local and national level can stay out of the democracy of war and a war economy at this time as well. A thank you and how continuing to work towards openness and better ideals at the local level in this country at this time can give needed good examples and best practices for all sides in Israel, Gaza, and the Middle East at this time as well. Thanks for the meeting today. Good luck to ourselves in 2024. Uh, thank, you. thank you. Our final speaker will be the original draw. You can go ahead when you're ready. The common law is the real law of the land, the supreme law of the land. The codes, rules, regulations, policies, and statutes are not the law. Legislated statutes are forced upon the people in the name of law or fraud. They have no authority and are without mercy. Justice without mercy is godless and therefore repugnant to our United States Constitution. Lawmakers were given the authority by the people to legislate codes, rules, regulations, statutes, which are policies, procedures, and law to control the behavior of bureaucrats, elected and appointed officials municipalities and agencies, but were never given authority to control the behavior of the people as we read in the US as Supreme Court decision. Only people are sovereign and have rights. Bureaucrats in their capacity are not sovereign and have no rights, and they have authority given by the people and are subject to the statutes. The state cannot diminish the rights of the people. The assertion of the federal rights, the Bill of Rights, when made plainly and reasonably made, is not to be defeated under the name of local practice. Where rights secured by the Constitution are involved, there can be no rulemaking or legislation which abrogate them. There can be no sanction or penalty imposed upon one because of this exercise of constitutional rights. Sovereignty itself is, of course, subject not subject to law, for it is the author and source of law. To deprive the people of their sovereignty is the first necessary to get the people to agree to submit to the authority of the... Thank you. Your time has expired. And, Chair, that concludes the public comments. All right. With that, we are at the end of our last meeting. Again, thank you, Hassan, for your service. Congratulations, Colleen, for um, being our interim. Thank you everyone for staying all the way to three o'clock. Um, and uh, I just wanna say, uh, I know that the Sanex uh, team, the staff is listening. Uh, thank you for all of your work this year. There was a lot of work that we got done. Very much appreciate you. I know the board appreciates everything that you do for our community, for the region. We are so grateful for all of you. For the team that's here behind us to making sure that this board is able to function, we are so grateful for you, for your leadership, for everybody that puts these packets together to make sure that all of us are able to uh, do our work. We are grateful for you. Um, thank you for everything. I hope you uh, have some time to rest and, um, and spend time with your families if you celebrate the holidays. And if you don't, I hope you get some time to rest and, um, you know, do whatever you have to do during the holidays as well. So with that, uh, this board of directors meeting will be Friday, January 12th at 10 a.m. Feliz Navidad, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Kansa, everything else. Que Dios los bendiga. Bye.